person or remotely via online video conferencing. In accordance with the updated guidance issued by the attending physician, members, staff, and members of the press present in the hearing room are not required to wear a mask, although you can do so if you want. For members participating remotely, your microphones will be set on mute for the purpose of eliminating inadvertent background noise. Members participating remotely will need to unmute your microphone each time you wish to speak. Please note that once you unmute your microphone, anything that is said in WebEx will be heard over the loudspeakers in the committee room and subject to be heard by the live stream and C-SPAN. Since members are participating from different locations at today's hearing, all recognition of members, such as for questions, will be in the order of subcommittee seniority. Documents for the record can be sent to Joe Orlando at the email address we provided to staff. All documents yeah. will be entered into the record at the conclusion of the hearing. The chair now well, recognizes himself. A is there, is that noise in the background? If someone doesn't have their uh, self muted, uh, please mute your microphones until you're recognized. Uh, the chair now recognizes himself for five minutes for an opening statement. Well, welcome and thank you all for being here today. A special welcome to our witnesses and I thank them for their contributions to this discussion. I'm very glad to be holding this hearing on such an important issue. As the subcommittee with jurisdiction over spectrum and federal and commercial spectrum management, I'm heartened that the communications and technology subcommittee has shown such bipartisan leadership and interest on this issue. Spectrum policy is not an issue on the top of the average consumer's mind, but it plays a significant role in their everyday lives. The average U.S. household has 25 connected devices, smartphone penetration is above 80 percent, and wireless device subscriptions outnumber the U.S. population. We use baby monitors and garage door openers, listen to the radio and watch TV using our mobile devices, and our factories, farms, and transportation systems are ever more connected, many of them wirelessly. All of these users are dependent on spectrum, and the American economy is dependent on spectrum. And as we push towards 100% broadband connectivity at home, spectrum will be necessary for customers regardless of whether they have a wired or fixed wireless connection. So it's our job as members of this subcommittee to make sure spectrum policy continues to enable these uses and opens new opportunities for the next generation technologies and innovations. Fundamentally, we need to use our nation's airways as efficiently as possible. With an eye on the exponential growth of wireless data usage, we know more spectrum will need to be made available for consumer use. This means the federal government, which still holds a majority of this country's spectrum, needs to use its spectrum allocations more efficiently, recognize spectrum sharem as a viable opportunity, and work cooperatively with neighboring commercial spectrum users. For Congress, we should recognize the spectrum demands of the federal government and give agencies the tools they need in this process. With our commercial spectrum, we must achieve a balance of both licensed and unlicensed spectrum. It's important to make spectrum available to sustain the deployment of 5G and to pave the way for 6G. At the same time, we need to identify spectrum for unlicensed use to sustain the explosive traffic we've seen in Wi-Fi and to fuel the next generation of Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi 7. I believe the lower three gigahertz band presents an enormous opportunity for making additional consumer-oriented spectrum available. The Spectrum Innovation Act strikes the right balance between federal incumbent users' needs and the importance of their missions and maximizing spectrum for consumer use. With additional spectrum reallocated to the private sector, new opportunities will arise for additional uses in both licensed and unlicensed spectrum bands. And I want to take a moment to thank Ranking Member Latta and his staff for the work they've been doing with my team to find a bipartisan path forward for this bill. I'm looking forward to moving it with their support. Another item that needs swift action by Congress is the extension of the FCC's ability to conduct spectrum auctions. I think it would be a mistake for Congress to let this authority lapse. In addition to how spectrum is used, 
We also must look at how these spectrum allocation decisions are made. And it's imperative that we reevaluate our country's spectrum management policies. Congress is taking steps, such as with the Spectrum Coordination Act, and NTIA and the FCC are acting as well, as their announcement on increased cooperation demonstrates. So with Ranking, Mata, Ranking Member Latta, I recently laid out some principles that should help guide us. NTIA must continue to be recognized throughout the federal government as the entity tasked with balancing the needs and concerns of the federal government. Clear rules and expectations for all spectrum users will lead to better outcomes. These rules and processes should be based on science and engineering. And lastly, the federal government needs to speak with a clear, unified voice when making spectrum decisions. Recommitting ourselves to these principles will lead to better management policies and ultimately better outcomes for both the federal and non-federal users of spectrum. And while, the, while these are weedy topics, uh, how we approach them will affect our constituents greatly and it will also affect how our economy can function and grow. So, I look forward to hearing the witnesses' expert testimony and their thoughts and concerns, of, and the thoughts and concerns of my colleagues. And uh, now, uh, thank you to our panelists, and I'm now yielding to my friend, uh, Ranking Member Latta, for his opening statement. Well, thank you much, Mr. Chairman, my friend. Uh, thank you very much for holding today's hearing, and also I want to thank our witnesses for being with us today. It's so great to look out and see all your smiling faces today, so it's <laughs> wonderful to be all in the same room together. For decades, the U.S. has pioneered innovative ways to manage one of our nation's most valuable resources, access to the airways. Decisions on how best to utilize these airways to maximize their potential has led to the growth of Wi-Fi, multiple generations of mobile technology from 2G to 5G, the app economy, and so much more. The massive benefits these technologies have had have been truly transformational to our economy and our way of life. A recent report estimates that unlicensed spectrum generates over $95 billion per year in the connected technology market. I am a co-chair of the Wi-Fi Caucus, and when, and when Wi-Fi was first created, no one could have predicted the impact it would have on our economy. The same is true for lights and spectrum use. In the 1990s, Congress exclusively provided the FCC the authority to auction off license and use a portion of the airways. Since then, the FCC has held over 100 auctions for various slices of the airways to power everything from 3G to the radio. In addition to ushering in a new way to harness the efficiency of the free market, the FCC Auction Authority has played a critical role in paving the way for new innovative services. By auctioning licenses for certain portions of the airways, users have certainty that they can invest upwards of tens of billions of dollars in the infrastructure necessary to use those airways without fear of being interfered with. The last two auctions alone have netted over $100 billion to the U.S. Treasury. However, as more and more of the spectrum is being used, auctioning spectrum has become more complex. As new commercial uses are introduced, the possibility of those use cases raising the potential for harmful interference has put a spotlight on how the FCCs make such a decision. These concerns are magnified when federal agencies are using a band adjacent to a new commercial user. Over the years, we have seen challenges with how agencies coordinate their plans for introducing new services and studying the potential for harmful interference. As the Energy and Commerce Committee continues to build on its work to improve the spectrum management process, we should be looking at how these decisions will build trust in the engineering and certainty in the licensing process. That, when a decision is made, all users can accept the result, not work to further undermine it. With the FCC's authority expiring at the end of the fiscal year to uh, conduct an auction and issue licenses, it is important that the Energy and Commerce Committee review what has worked, what has not, and is able to provide necessary direction to the FCC as the spectrum issues become more difficult. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today on the opportunities and challenges they lay ahead for smartly managing our spectrum resources. Again, I want to thank our witnesses for being with us. I want to thank my friend, the chairman, for holding this hearing today, and I'd like to yield the remaining balance of my uh, time to my good friend from Louisiana, Mrs. Scalise. Uh, thank the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Latta, for yielding. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for hosting, holding this hearing. I really appreciate the witnesses being here. Uh, when you look over the years, 
Congress, and especially this subcommittee and the Energy and Commerce Committee have led the way in bringing forth bipartisan action to assert U.S. global leadership in wireless innovation. It's one of those times where we actually do come together to get some really good things done, and it starts right here in this room. Under the leadership of former FCC Chairman Pai with President Trump, the FCC auctioned off several spectrum bands for commercial use, leading to great consumer benefit and huge strides in innovation. Additionally, these auctions have generated billions of private sector investment, with the most recent C-band auction generating a record of more than $80 billion in revenue. And by the way, that $80.9 billion that was generated far exceeded the Congressional Budget Office's estimates of 20 to 35 billion. So they thought it would generate 20 to 35 billion, and with the private sector stepping up uh, and putting forth their own capital, over $80 billion was generated. Uh, we want to see that continue. So it's critical that our nation's spectrum management process work efficiently. As Congress considers reauthorizing the FCC's spectrum author, uh, author authority action, it's important to allow the FCC to complete pending auctions as well, uh, and you look at the 2.5 gigahertz, uh, gigahertz band, that's one area, but also to continue to give the private sector even more opportunities to build out their networks. Moving forward, it's imperative we do the, what we can to avoid needless delays in deployment, and we also need to allow providers to operate in the spectrum that they've paid for and encourage further investments so that America can continue to lead the world while also heading off the threat posed by China. And this committee's taken specific action to address that as well. So I look forward to hearing from the witnesses. And uh, thank you again, uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Latta, yield back the balance of my time. Mr. Chairman, will you back the balance of our time? Gentleman yields back. Chair now recognizes Mr. Pallone, Chairman of the full committee, for five minutes for his opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Doyle. This committee has a long tradition of working together in a bipartisan fashion to lay the groundwork for technological innovation in this country, and this hearing is no exception. Today we begin exploring the next frontier of wireless technology, and I believe it's more important than ever that we lay the foundation for our nation to continue to lead the world in critical technological advancements. There's no question that our nation's airwaves are the engine that has powered so much technological growth. Without them, we would not have wireless emergency alerts, the app economy, smartphones, messaging services, the internet of things, and of course, drones. So just imagine that for a moment, so much of this technology we rely on every day simply would not exist. These are remarkable achievements, but our, our past success does not always dictate the present or the future. Our nation's global leadership in providing consumers with access to 4G wireless technology and Wi-Fi does not guarantee we will see the same result in 5G or next generation wireless technology such as 6G and Wi-Fi 7. The stakes could not be higher. Failure to replenish the commercial spectrum pipeline risks the United States falling behind our counterpart counterparts across the globe, including China, in producing cutting-edge consumer innovations and enhancing our national security capabilities. And since transitioning our airwaves to allow for new uses takes time, we have to start to put the necessary pieces together now so that the U.S. can be ready for the wireless technologies of tomorrow. And this is especially important because China has already reportedly made three times as much mid-band spectrum available for 5G compared to the United States. Mid-band spectrum delivers the best of both worlds when it comes to wireless broadband, faster speeds, less buffering, and access to a signal indoors. And these are the airwaves that will fuel advancements in telehealth services, public safety, manufacturing, and supply chain management. But it's not enough to simply make our airwaves available for commercial use. We must have the ability to place these radio waves in the hands of innovators who can put them to good use for the public's benefit. So since 1994, the Federal Communications Commission has accomplished this feat through its Spectrum Auction Program and through truly remarkable and innovative unlicensed Spectrum policies. The FCC's auction program has been a resounding success, raising $200 billion in federal revenue since its inception. And now the FCC's Spectrum Auction Authority must be extended or it will expire in about six months and without an extension, the FCC may not be able to complete at least one mid-band spectrum, mid spectrum auction, and auctions that have already occurred may not be able to properly close. And so for these reasons, I urge my colleagues to work 
in a bipartisan way to extend this authority once again. We must do this well before the FCC begins its planned auction of the 2.5 gigahertz ban in July. Otherwise, the auction will be disrupted. And Congress would also be able to put auction proceeds to good use by funding priorities like promoting digital equity, next generation 911, or the replacement of suspect communications equipment. So we must also ensure that the federal government speaks with one voice when it comes to our airwaves. And that's why Chairman Doyle and Ranking Member Lattice's Spectrum Innovation Act is so key. It will help clarify how important spectrum auctions are on the horizon should operate to keep our processes streamlined. I'm also pleased to see that the new leaders at the National Telecommunications and Information Administration and the FCC have already started making some headway towards ensuring the two agencies speak with one voice. Both agencies recently announced a new spectrum coordination initiative that aligns with legislation this committee unanimously reported to the House back in November. And this initiative will also produce a national spectrum strategy, which I strongly support, and creating this important guidepost will better position NTIA and the FCC to meet the current and future spectrum demands of consumers, commercial carriers, and federal agencies alike. So obviously we have a lot to discuss today as we explore the next wireless frontier, and I, I welcome our panelists and look forward to hearing from them. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Chair now recognizes Mrs. Rogers, the ranking member of the full committee, for five minutes for her opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before I begin, we just heard from President Zelensky, a strong and courageous leader for the freedom-loving people of Ukraine. America must stand and support Ukraine's call for freedom and self-determination. And that includes countering Putin's evil and unjust attacks by ending his ability to use energy to fund this war, by flipping the switch on for energy dominance in America and for our allies. This committee has the opportunity to lead and to answer President Zelensky's call to do more. And I continue to urge us to do that. Now to the topic of today, the success of our nation's wireless future. It depends on good management of our spectrum resources. The United States is the world leader in wireless technology. We led in deploying 4G. And today our witnesses and our, our wire and our wireless carriers are working to make sure we lead in fifth generation technology. I just climbed a 180-foot tower with Commissioner Brandon Carr and made the first 5G call in eastern Washington. 5G is going to be a game changer for rural communities. To win the future, we must continue to make spectrum available, promote innovation, and keep up with the demands for new and improved wireless technologies. The efficient use of our spectrum resources will be essential to keep up with the demand for wireless devices. Under President Trump, the FCC made an unprecedented amount of spectrum available for commercial use, including over 3,400 megahertz of licensed millimeter wave spectrum, 280 megahertz of licensed spectrum in the C-band, and an additional 100 megahertz of valuable mid-band spectrum in the 3450 to 3550 megahertz band. This brought in over 100 billion. Wireless carriers also work closely with federal incumbents and the NTIA on developing technology in the 3.5 gigahertz band known as the Citizens Broadband Radio Service Band, the CBRS, which auctioned licensed spectrum while protecting Navy radars using the fre frequencies. The FCC also made 1,200 megahertz of unlicensed spectrum available in the six gigahertz band. We're starting to see next generation technologies being developed to utilize that spectrum. We must build on this success, providing certainty to both industry and government agencies for spectrum reallocations and auctions is a top priority. This includes addressing the FCC's expiring auction authority to ensure auctions such as the 3.45 and the 2.5 gigahertz bands are successful and able to be completed. And making sure that costly fights like we've had between the FCC, NTIA, FAA, and industry over C-band do not become the norm. Without that certainty, we cannot expect industry to invest the billions of dollars needed to clear spectrum bands in the future. To maintain U.S. leadership in wireless technology, we need a national spectrum strategy that outlines goals, objectives, and actions that can be taken by federal agencies and industry to ensure the most efficient use of spectrum. 
That said, even with a national strategy, repurposing spectrum is becoming more difficult. It's crucial that the FCC, NTIA, federal agencies, and wireless stakeholders work together. Federal agencies have legitimate spectrum needs for their systems. However, the timeline for upgrading their systems to be more efficient does not keep pace with commercial technology. As spectrum repurposing has become more difficult, many federal agencies have resorted to public fear-mongering rather than work through established spectrum management process. During recent high-profile spectrum disputes, we've seen agencies, such as the Department of Transportation, attempt to assert its authority over commercial spectrum bans where their agencies do not hold licenses. These costly interagency inter battles threaten our ability to lead the world in next-gen communications. We must have trust in the expertise at NTIA and the FCC and confidence in the established process as we continue to push for stable spectrum pipelines. Meanwhile, adversaries like China and Russia are trying to undermine our leadership. China is actively trying to use international standard setting institutions to set standards that favor their technology over ours. We must work together to enhance the participation by U.S. companies in setting international standards. My colleague, Mr. Wahlberg, is leading legislation that requires NTIA to do just that. I also, also strongly support Doran Bogdan Martin's candidacy to become the Secretary General of the International Telecommunications Union. Doreen is running against a candidate from the Russian Federation. Given recent atrocities by Russia, it is essential that we stand behind Doreen and help keep the internet open and safe. I look forward to hearing from all our witnesses. I yield back. Gentlewoman yields back. Uh, Chair would like to remind members that pursuant to committee rules, all members' written opening statements shall be made part of the record. So now it gives me great pleasure to introduce our witnesses for today's hearing, uh, starting with Greg Geis, Director of Government Affairs, Public Knowledge, Vaughn Todd, Chief Executive of Corporate Strategy and Analytics, HTC Incorporated, and Director of the Competitive Carriers Association Board of Directors, Jane Stankevich, Global Executive Director, Product and Digital Infrastructure Policy with Intel, and Scott Bergman, Senior Vice President, Regulatory Affairs, CTIA, and Mary Brown, Senior Director, Government Affairs, Cisco Systems Incorporated. Uh, as you know, uh, you all have five minutes for your opening statements. There's a little box there in front of you that uh, when you have one minute left will turn yellow. And then at the end of five minutes, it'll turn red. And if you speak longer than that, a trap door opens up under your chair and you're whisked down to the Rayburn subway and, and out of here. So let's try to stay to the five minute rules and we'll try to enforce it up here with our colleagues uh, too. So. Uh, with that, I want to thank uh, everyone, and, and uh, Mr. Geis, you are now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman Doyle and Chairman Pallone, Ranking Member Latta, and Mick Morris Rogers. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to testify here today. We really do appreciate it. My name is Greg Geis. I'm Director of Government Affairs at Public Knowledge. We're a public interest organization dedicated to promoting freedom of expression and open internet and access to affordable communications and creative works. As members of this committee are well aware, we are in the midst of a connectivity revolution. As more devices and services demand spectrum resources, the policy to satisfy that demand is becoming increasingly challenging. To meet that challenge, we must first use all of the tools in the toolbox to provide access. That's licensed, unlicensed, open access, sharing. Second, as this committee just recognized, we have to insist on expert coordination led by the FCC and NTIA. And third, we need to emphasize the public interest first and foremost in our spectrum policy. Supporting those structural components will allow policymakers to address the spectrum needs, to secure opportunities for all Americans, and to maintain our collective uh, global competitiveness. As R Ranking Member McMorris Rogers just noted, demand for connected devices and PACS efforts to meet that demand means that there are few greenfield opportunities remaining. Everyone has to work to enhance efficient use of spectrum, and policymakers will need to focus on issues such as spectrum utilization by incumbents and tightening of technical parameters, including receivers. In addition, we need to use all the tools in the toolbox when it comes to access. 
back in 2009 and 2010 when I was honored to serve as counsel on this committee under then Chairman Waxman. He, Representative Doyle, Representative Eshoo, and a number of other folks on this committee made the case that we do not need to frame our spectrum policy in terms of a fight between licensed and unlicensed. Rather, they were calling then for what we now know as the sounder framing, a mix of access regimes that promote spectrum efficiency and a healthy, vibrant wireless sector. An example of that, an example that brings that into focus is the FCC CBRS proceeding. There, the FCC, through great coordination, chose a three-tiered access regime that brought, that balanced the needs of protecting ongoing incumbent use while creating opportunities for commercial license services as well as open access spectrum use. They did it all without interference. CBRS and other successful sharing efforts show that policymakers, when they do focus, should focus on uh, remaining open to the idea of exploring the full suite of access regimes when considering any spectrum band. As members of this committee, you're also well aware of the importance of spectrum coordination and interagency process. As Chairman Doyle and Ranking Member Latta wrote in their op-ed last week, it is essential that the interagency coordination process be followed and that it be made clear NTIA is the agency to hear concerns of federal agencies and the, and the agency that is meant to address those concerns. We're also encouraged, as was just recognized, that the FCC and NTIA are working on uh, their uh, spectrum coordination update. They've reestablished high-level meetings. They're updating the memorandum on understanding, promoting evidence-based spectrum compatibility analysis, and developing a nation, national spectrum policy. All of this is critical to restoring our interagency process. As this committee and the FCC explores new spectrum opportunities, we must ensure that every allocation serves the public interest, convenience, and necessity. This means more than simply making spectrum available for new, new services. It, ensure, it includes ensuring that members of our society, all members, including rural communities, low-income communities, and communities of color, enjoy the benefits of these spectrum technologies, both as consumers and as creators and innovators. Simply put, spectrum policy should serve the public interest as Congress has directed. I wanted to spend some time this morning discussing access regimes, interagency coordination, and the need to focus on public interest because those elements are key to the next phase of exploring the wireless frontier. In my written testimony, I go over five uh, opportunities uh, in detail but just to briefly mention them here in closing so that I don't fall through the trap, uh, to advance the public interest need, Congress should renew the FCC's auction authority and should support public interest needs with those auction revenues. The committee should consider how auction revenues could advance public interest objectives, such as digital equity, something Chairman Pallone just recognized, and that public knowledge and other co uh, public interest groups have joined in coalition to support as part of our Airwaves for Equity campaign. And that doesn't mean NG911, a dedicated wireless fund and other public interest needs can't be satisfied as well. To promote sharing opportunities, the committee should look at the lower three gigahertz band. The Spectrum Innovation Act is a great opportunity to do that work, and we look forward to working with you as that moves forward in this committee. We also hope this committee will encourage the FCC to think about opening up the 12 gigahertz uh, band for a variety of uses. Uh, that protect the incumbent satellite opportunities, but also allow for a greater mixed use of that band so that we can fully utilize it. And finally, I think this committee can support uh, sensing technologies and advances in incumbent informing capabilities that promote sharing as well. Uh, thank you for your consideration. I'm pleased to answer any questions. Sorry to go over time. I was just gonna say your chair was looking lower as you were <laughs> speaking. Uh, Mr. Todd, you're recognized for five minutes. Chairman Dole, Republican Leader Latta, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify. I'm pleased to represent HTC and serve on the board of directors for the Competitive Carriers Association. HTC is the nation's largest telecommunications cooperative, where our local subscribers are our owners. We call them our members. For over 70 years, HTC has been the leading communications provider for coastal South Carolina. 
I'm excited about the role that wireless plays in our future and HTC's efforts to bring the latest communication services to our members throughout our service area. And while the potential of wireless services, including 5G and beyond, is limitless, a key input needed to make that potential reality is Spectrum. Carriers depend on sustainable and predictable access to Spectrum, a finite resource. Congress can support efforts to ensure that all Americans have access to the latest wireless services in three ways. First, by extending the FCC Spectrum Auction Authority. Second, by bringing additional bands of Spectrum to the market for licensed commercial use. And third, making sure that winning auction bidders can swiftly and efficiently put those Spectrum resources to use to serve consumers. HTC was formed in 1952 and has over 700 employees working to provide the latest services to our over 100,000 local members. We support local economic development and community and educational programs. Even further, HTC returns excess revenues earned back to our members in the form of capital credits, totaling over $153 million to date. We work hard to meet the needs and provide a high level of service to all of our members, serving a geographically and demographically diverse region that stretches from urban tourism destinations to rural farmlands. The COVID-19 pandemic highlighted the urgent need for access to broadband services, and as a cooperative, HTC made efforts to provide connectivity as part of our COVID response with bill credits, installing new community and school hotspots, and participating in the EBB program, now the Affordable Connectivity Program. I appreciate and thank the members of this committee for creating and maintaining this important tool to put connectivity within reach for more of our community. HTC provides a full range of communication services to our members and wireless connectivity is an important tool in our portfolio and depends on our ability to access spectrum resources. Wireless services are particularly important to reach more rural and impoverished areas, especially where larger companies will not expand to provide service as well as more urban areas where larger companies have us locked out. The spectrum needed to provide reliable wireless connectivity is only available through license from the federal government, most typically obtained through FCC-led spectrum auctions or through secondary market transactions. Importantly, FCC auctions allow for things like smaller license sizes. This is critical for smaller companies like ours. To continue to bring the latest services to market, we need to know that additional spectrum will be made available and we need to make sure that Congress extends the FCC Spectrum Auction Authority. This year's 2.5 gigahertz auction will make spectrum available in our markets. Gaining access to this spectrum would provide us with increased confidence in our ability to meet the future data needs of our subscribers and enhance our ability to compete. Expansion of auction authority will ensure that carriers like HTC have the certainty needed to fully participate in the upcoming 2.5 gigahertz auction. We strongly encourage Congress and the FCC to maintain a predictable, sufficient supply of spectrum to meet growing wireless demands, including in low, mid, and high bands, and in ways that allow smaller carriers to meaningfully participate. Finally, while the FCC should make additional spectrum bands available for wireless use, the interagency spectrum coordination process should be improved. I thank members of this committee for working to enhance and restore faith in the process, including efforts to update the memorandum of understanding between the FCC and NTIA. In closing, 5G and other next generation wireless technologies will rapidly expand connectivity and improve many aspects of everyday life. To ensure our networks can expand and meet the demands of the next wireless frontier, Greater access to spectrum is essential. Thank you, and I welcome your questions. Thank you, Mr. Todd. Chair now recognizes Ms. Stankavich for five minutes. Chairman Doyle, Ranking Member Lada, and members of the sub subcommittee, thank you for inviting me today to provide a global perspective on spectrum policies to enable 5G, next generation Wi Fi, and 6G. I am responsible for Intel's global policy efforts related to get digital infrastructure, including connectivity, 5G, Wi-Fi, and 6G, AI, AVs, and IoT, including smart cities and healthcare. I have extensive experience working in 
at the national, regional, and global level, including the ITU and the World Radio Communication Conferences. Intel is one of only three semiconductor manufacturers in the world using advanced nodes. Intel semiconductor products are foundational to personal, cloud, quantum, and high-performance computing, AI, IoT, AVs, and most importantly for today's hearing, 5G and Wi-Fi. 5G runs on Intel. We are a leading semi-silicon provider for infrastructure, and Intel is also a leader in Wi-Fi and Bluetooth technology solutions for the PC market. Intel plays an active role throughout the wireless technology lifecycle, from developing wireless standards to enable infrastructure and end-user devices. With respect to spectrum pipeline considerations, it's crucial to replenish the U.S. spectrum pipeline for mobile broadband technologies in low, mid, and high bands to meet near-term and long-term deployment goals for consumers and a wide range of businesses. As FCC Chairwoman Rosenworcel recently stated, for 6G, we need to start planning now to identify spectrum in the 7 to 15 gigahertz range. 6G may also utilize high bands, including bands above 95 gigahertz, as well as low bands. Replenishing the spectrum pipeline requires not just deciding which bands to study, but also ensuring the timely results of study and commercial availability of the spectrum, including bands, for example, such as the lower 3 gigahertz bands. Making decisions on spectrum in a timely manner is crucial to enabling a U.S. leadership role in wireless globally. For example, the FCC's decision to open the 6 gigahertz spectrum for Wi-Fi has been transformative, with over 60 countries following the U.S. lead. So what is a timely manner? To provide some perspective on this issue, the ITU targeted completion of 5G high band spectrum process in November 2019. To enable commercialization, the Intel team completed our internal analysis of the status of availability as well as technical characteristics four years prior to that, in September of 2015. The FCC issued its first report in order making high band spectrum available over three years before the target date. Over the next few years, other leading countries also took steps on 5G spectrum. As a result of the FCC's early action, when the international treaty deliberations occurred, much of U.S. high-band spectrum was harmonized for use for mobile broadband technologies at the World Radio Communication Conference 2019. For 6G, the I2 process is scheduled to be completed in 2030. Looking at back at the previous timeline, the question I have is, do we think the U.S. is on track to make spectrum available for 6G by around mid-2016? 26, sorry, we'll get an extra 10 years. <laughs> Unless we move rapidly now, the U.S. will not be in a position to take a leadership role to help define which spectrum ranges will be utilized globally for 6G. Moving on to the importance of interagency cooperation, coordination, NTIA must be empowered to represent the federal agencies to ensure, together with the FCC, that the nation's spectrum resources are managed in the public interest. Additionally, extension of the FCC's Spectrum Auction Authority will be important for continued U.S. broadband deployment efforts. Finally, despite the crucial nature of semiconductors underpinning all of this technology, America has lost significant share of semiconductor production to Asia over the last 30 years, creating a 30% cost disadvantage for chip making in the U.S. Federal investment is urgently needed to reverse this erosion by leveling the playing field for America's semiconductor industry. Congress took the first step by authorizing the Chips for America Act early last year. And while Intel is doing its part to invest in American technology leadership, Congress must finish the job by conferencing the bills containing Chips Act funding as soon as possible. This investment will bolster the U.S. semiconductor capacity that underpins the deployment of 5G and other digital infrastructure. Thank you for holding a hearing on this important topic, and we look forward to working with the committee, the FCC, NTIA, and other federal agencies to ensure the Spectrum Pipeline continues to flow to support U.S. broadband development and deployment. Thank you very much. Mr. Bergman, you're recognized for five minutes. Chairman Doyle, Ranking Member Latta, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to be with you and testify today. 
I'm Scott Bergman, and on behalf of CTI and the wireless industry, I want to thank you for your focus on creating smart spectrum policies for 5G and our country's future. In particular, we commend the committee for its long-standing practice of identifying specific bands for the FCC to auction. For example, in the 2020 Beat China for 5G Act and the Ray Bombs Act of 2018. Fueled by a remarkable record of investment, 5G wireless broadband networks are transforming the way that we live and work. 5G is also helping to protect our planet. According to a recent Accenture study, 5G will enable a 20% contribution towards our nation's carbon emission reduction targets, helping the country to meet our climate change goals. And now fixed wireless 5G, with its expanded capabilities, is helping to bridge the digital divide and bring competitive choice to the home broadband market. Of course, every benefit that we're experiencing with 5G in the US, expanding digital inclusion, job creation, smart cities, and improvements in public safety, healthcare, and our environment, is predicated on the availability of spectrum. With demand for fixed and mobile 5G services increasing exponentially, we need to free up additional spectrum, especially licensed mid-band. FCC Chairwoman Rosenworcel should be commended for moving quickly on the 3.45 gigahertz auction last year, as directed by this committee. And her recent announcement of the 2.5 gigahertz auction is a welcome sign. After this auction, however, the spectrum pipeline goes empty. In the meantime, other nations understand that global leadership in wireless hinges on access to spectrum. Leading nations are making available, on average, approximately 650 megahertz of licensed mid-band, more than twice what we have in, in the US today. We're playing catch up, but with the right policies, we can maintain our global wireless leadership. We offer to the committee today four recommendations to keep the US as the global leader in wireless. First, the FCC's auction authority is slated to expire in September, and congressional action is needed to ensure that the agency can auction and license spectrum that will deliver 5G to US consumers and businesses. Auctions have proven to be the bedrock of 5G and US mobile wireless networks. Since 1993, when Congress established our first in the world spectrum auction authority, it has never allowed that authority to lapse. On five occasions, Congress has granted broad auction authority and in all but one, a short-term one-year extension, it has used these opportunities to direct auctions of specific bands. CTI urges Congress to do the same this year. Second, it's in our national interest to identify a spectrum pipeline of bands that can be auctioned for exclusive license use. The lower three gigahertz band is a top priority. This band is adjacent to existing full power commercial spectrum and offers the ability to provide large channels making it an ideal fit for Congress, for, for 5G. And, and Congress can now take steps to streamline this access. And we support the Spectrum Innovation Act, which would enhance the process to bring that critical band to auction. Congress should also take steps to identify and set clear deadlines for future access to other mid-band spectrum, as well as low and high bands, at the same time that it extends auction authority. Congress has long leveraged congressionally directed spectrum auctions to advance other key national priorities, including deficit reduction and first net. We, of course, defer to the committee on how auction proceeds should be spent and welcome the opportunity to collaborate. We would note that Chairwoman Rosenworcel recently proposed using proceeds for NG911 purposes. That's an important goal and worthy of all our support. Paired with a clear pipeline of 5G-friendly spectrum auctions, such an approach could provide a much needed boost to our nation's 911 system and our wireless leadership. Third, CTI supports calls for a national spectrum strategy, which can help to meet this challenge and provide go go guideposts for advancing US 5G leadership. Finally, there's much that we can do to revitalize a unified government voice on spectrum management. While the US government's spectrum process generally works well, it broke down in the C-band altimeter debate. We commend the recent FCC NTIA Spectrum Coordination Initiative as an important first step. As a nation, we can and must do better. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Brown, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Doyle, Ranking Member Latta, and members of the subcommittee. My name is Mary Brown, and I'm here to provide you with Cisco Systems' views on the future of wireless. Thank you for the invitation to testify. 
Cisco Systems is a $49 billion global provider of IP-based networking equipment, solutions, and services located in San Jose, California. Our customer base spans enterprise customers, governments, and service providers. In wireless, Cisco offers Wi-Fi and private 5G solutions. Spectrum is vital to all our customers. Thanks to the leadership from Congress, the United States finds itself in the enviable position of being a technology leader in both unlicensed and licensed technology. Not only does this mean that US consumers get the best and get it first, but companies, domestic and foreign, see the US as a place where advanced technologies are developed and deployed. Wi-Fi is a prime example of a technology that has benefited from congressional and FCC leadership, and here are three recent statistics that prove it. Annual US revenues for the sale of unlicensed devices are approaching $100 billion annually, while the total economic value of Wi-Fi in the United States will reach as much as 1.6 trillion by 2025. The dollars are big, but the number of devices is even larger. Comcast reported last fall that its customers are connecting nearly 1 billion devices on its network alone. In the 2018 Mobile Now Act, Congress declared as a matter of federal policy, the FCC must provide for unlicensed spectrum. In 2020, the FCC opened 1,200 megahertz of unlicensed spectrum in the six gigahertz band, paving the way for a new six gigahertz generation of Wi-Fi. As broadband networks increase in speed, whether 5G, fixed or mobile, cable, fiber, or satellite, so too must Wi-Fi that operates at the edge. Wi-Fi is also the most widely deployed spectrum technology in American business. 5G will soon become part of that enterprise story, and as Cisco, we are looking forward to enabling a convergence of Wi-Fi and 5G for our enterprise customers. For 6G, the Alliance of Te for Telecommunications Industry Solutions, a North Amer American standards organization, has launched the Next G Alliance, enabling the US to develop a consensus vision on what it hopes 6G will uniquely accomplish. Turning to the question of uh, spectrum coordination, on government agency disagreements, there is probably one unfortunate issue upon which we can all agree. We have not found that happy place in spectrum policy decision making where collaboration reigns over confrontation. While my written testimony contains several suggestions, here are two points that are most important. First, Congress should make clear to NTIA and to the executive branch generally that it wants NTIA to be the lead agency on spectrum matters. Second, the recently revised FCC NTIA Memorandum of Understanding is an important development that we should all celebrate, underscoring the importance of agencies working together. On auction re reauthorization, Congress has maintained FCC auction authority since it was first adopted in 1993, and it should renew that authority this year as Congress and the FCC continue to work on more spectrum for 5G and ultimately 6G. Many continue to think of auctions as simply a budget reconciliation tool. It is true that over the decades, auctions have amassed over $175 billion, enabling spending on a variety of important public interest programs. However, thinking about auctions narrowly as a vehicle that puts cash into the federal budget ATM misses the mark. Far more important is the economic value measurable in hundreds of billions of dollars of contributions to the GDP created by the networks that have been built as a result of auctions. Auctions serve other important purposes. In 2012, Congress authorized the first incentive auction. This new form of auction provided a much needed tool to the FCC as it began its work of transitioning uh, spectrum allocations from 20th century technologies to 21st century ones. In conclusion, renewing auction authority remains highly relevant to 5G and 6G networks. Incentive auction authority is important to help us transition efficiently from old allocations to new ones. NTIA needs to be deemed the lead agency on spectrum within the executive branch, and spectrum policy should continue to enable the advance of both unlicensed and licensed radio technology. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, we've concluded uh, opening statements. Uh, we're now gonna move to member questions. Each member will have five minutes to ask questions of our witnesses. And I would ask all my colleagues who I love dearly to adhere to the five minute rule. 
<clears throat> lest you hear my gavel. I will start by recognizing myself for five minutes and try to set a good example. So, as we've heard from our witnesses today and as demonstrated by the strong demand in recent auctions for wireless licenses, mid-band spectrum is vitally important for wireless connectivity. Uh, our bill, the Spectrum Innovation Act, seeks to maximize the amount of spectrum available for consumer use in the 3.1 to 3.45 mid prime mid-band spectrum. Uh, Mr. Geis, as an advocate for innovative and competitive spectrum usage, can you discuss how you see the Spectrum Innovation Act producing uh, greater utilization of the band? Yeah, look, I think uh, it's a great question, and the act itself sort of sets out, like there are opportunities for licensing in this band, and there are opportunities for sharing. I think as we learned in the CVRS process, if we engage with DOD, we engage with NTIA and the FCC, we can structure a path forward that will result in more spectrum coming online for utilization than if we sort of lock ourselves into a camp on this spectrum. Thank you. Mr. Bergman, do you believe this legislation can help provide consumers with greater access to 5G and other next generation wireless technologies? Mr. Chairman, thank you for the question. Thank you for your focus on, on this legislation, uh, absolutely. Um, for 5G, it's all about mid-band, and the lower three gigahertz band is an absolutely critical band. So we appreciate your leadership with the Spectrum Innovation Act, which would speed access to this band. It's focus on having NTIA and the FCC in the room. Uh, it's focus on licensed spectrum. Uh, it's focus on a timeline for auction are all critical to moving this internationally harmonized key band to market. Thank you. So as spectrum usage increases, and our airways become more crowded, we're increasingly seeing confrontations between incumbents and new users, including even new users in the neighboring spectrum bands. So I'm glad to hear the witnesses reinforce the importance of having federal government engage in a coordinated spectrum management process. Ms. Brown, you discuss in your testimony how we manage the impact of new spectrum users on adjacent incumbent systems. Could you expound on that? and? and how that would shape the end user and consumer experience? Yes, thank you for the question. Um, I think the way in which we've equipped our agencies to resolve new band adjacencies is not lending itself to a successful resolution of issues uh, at this point. My, my observation around these issues, and it, it goes to C-band, but also to transportation spectrum and elsewhere, is that the decisions are often challenged by user communities who fear interference and who do not perceive that there's a voice in the decision-making process that addresses their concerns from their perspective. So to be clear, the user communities know a lot about their systems, but they don't know a lot about spectrum sharing or adjacencies. And so we've seen them striking a confrontational pose instead right. of a collaborative one. So we need to think about new ways to put um, new dynamics into the process that helps build consensus. In my testimony, I suggested a couple of things to explore. One is to put the NTIA's Boulder Lab more front and center in the middle of these, uh, of these issues to help build engineering consensus around what the right answers are. Another might be to give the FCC the authority to conduct independent engineering research, which it does not really do today, but which other regulators in other parts of the world do. The payout, of course, is enormous, because by, by sharpening the tools that the regulators have and building consensus, we can reduce the friction and we can get better use out of our airwaves which is a, a, a matter of interest to consumers, but it's also a matter of national competitiveness. Thank you. Uh, you know, much of today's discussion has been about domestic spectrum policies, but what happens at the international level certainly can have a direct impact on what happens here at home. So uh, for this reason, I'd like to take the opportunity to mention the upcoming leadership elections at the UN uh, International Telecommunications Union. Uh, I want to second what uh, Ranking Member Rogers uh, said the U.S. has nominated a very well-qualified candidate, Doreen Bogdan Martin, and it's important that Congress and the administration continue to advocate for her to be the next Secretary General of that body. Um, with these important considerations in mind and recognizing your experience within the international forums, Ms. Stankavich, I was hoping to hear from you how spectrum decisions here in the United States shape international conversations and global policies and how that ultimately impacts American consumers and companies. So could you please share your thoughts with us in 10 seconds? 
or I'm in big trouble with my colleagues. <laughs> it, it's absolutely crucial, Mr. Chairman. Um, that's that's a absolutely. great answer. <laughs> and with that, I yield back my time and recognize my good friend, Mr. Latta, for oh. five minutes. Well, I was waiting to see if your chair disappeared. <laughs> but thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Bergman, uh, you point out in your testimony the FCC's general authority to grant new permits or licenses for the use of spectrum expires on September 30th of this year. However, the FCC retained authority to auction spectrum for the lower 3 gigahertz band that was provided in the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. As Congress considers whether or how to reauthorize spectrum auction authority, what spectrum bands are in the pipeline, and how should Congress be thinking about extending the FCC's authority in continuing to make spectrum available for commercial use? Thank you, thank you, Ranking Member, for that question. Uh, it's, it's on two of the most important things for us, which is auction authority and having a spectrum pipeline. Um, in our 30 years with auction authority, it's never expired before. So this is new ground. It's really important that that be moved forward. And when Congress does that, we urge you to consider a spectrum pipeline. Uh, there are some really important candidates for us. It's all about mid-band spectrum. <coughs> the lower three gigahertz band, which you mentioned, is absolutely critical. There's work that's started on that now, but Congress can work to advance that and speed access to that band. Um, it's internationally harmonized. It's large channels. There are also other mid-bands that are really important as well, too. The seven gigahertz band is subject to focus. It's something that NTIA has looked at. We would urge this committee to look at. The four gigahertz band is a band that's being used internationally. We would urge this committee to look there as well too. Delighted to talk to you all about low and, and high bands as well too, but the focus really is on mid-band spectrum right now. Well, thank you. Uh, Ms. Brown, as you uh, may know, I am co-chair of the Wi-Fi Caucus, which is focused on the benefits that uh, unlicensed spectrum can provide for our economy and new and emergency technologies. Recently, the FCC made a significant amount of unlicensed spectrum available for Wi-Fi use. Would you speak to how Americans use both licensed and unlicensed spectrum, and what do you expect to see in terms of demand for both licensed and unlicensed spectrum in the next five to 10 years? Yeah. Thank you for the question. Thank you for the question. Um, the demand for any wireless technology, whether it's Wi-Fi or 5G, can just continues to rise. Um, Wi-Fi today and unlicensed spectrum represents more than half of all internet traffic. Um, because we are consuming uh, most wireless traffic when we are indoors, whether at work or at home. Um, that is not to say that 5G is unimportant. It is vitally important, uh, and we are going to be using a lot more of it in the future. Um, I, from a consumer perspective, um, what we are going to see, I think, is more of a convergence of the two ecosystems as we go forward. And one example of that would be the fixed 5G uh, offerings that are already in the marketplace, where the, uh, the traffic is hauled via 5G back to a base station, but in the home, um, the uh, connections to the actual devices are Wi-Fi. So more examples like that coming and more convergence, and it's going to be uh, uh, to the benefit of the American consumer. Well, thank you very much. Mr. Todd, uh, HTC Communications serves both rural and urban environments with a mix of licensed and unlicensed spectrum. Would you want to speak about how you identify your spectrum needs and what the 2.5 gigahertz spectrum auction would mean for a rural provider like HTC? Thank you for the question. So for HTC, mid-band spectrum means choice. It's critical for us for propagation and speed. It's important for scalability in markets that you mentioned, both rural and urban areas. So consumers would lose out without access to this technology as the increase for broadband uh, continues to grow and those needs uh, occur across our service area. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Dancavage, if I could uh, ask you a question. Something you said, if I heard you correctly, you know, the U.S. might not be in the lead in 6G. How do we wake people up to, around this place to make sure we stay uh, in the top? And what would happen if we're not in the lead in 6G? Uh, thank you for the question. And uh, before I start, I would like to say I've been with Intel for 20 years, and we expected a good uh, re uh, reception in Ohio, but it has far exceeded that. So many thanks uh, for that on behalf of my colleagues. We appreciate um, it. So in, in terms of 6G, um, it is really important. Um, I described, you know, the five-year gap, basically, where we had to intercept that with product development plans. 
And so when we look out to the 6G horizon, trying to complete that process internationally by 2030, um, I, I don't see the urgency that I think we need to have to make sure that we are in a position. So anything we can do to initiate those discussions and make sure they happen in a timely manner would make the U.S. really well placed to make sure that when those discussions happen globally, the U.S. positions are taken into account and we can coalesce countries around our position. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Are you back? Thank the gentleman. The chair now recognizes Chairman of the Full Committee, Mr. Pallone, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Doyle. Um, our airwaves should be used to advance fundamental ideals like free speech, association, and democracy. Authoritarian regimes like those in Russia and China, however, are using this resource instead to watch and track their people, spread disinformation, and shut down free speech. And that's why it's as important as ever that the U.S. and like-minded countries lead in the development and deployment of these technologies so that our public interest principles are at the center of any technological progress. So I wanted to ask Mr. Geis, can you explain, expand how we keep the public interest at the forefront of our spectrum policy? Uh, thank you, Chairman Pallone, for the question. It's, it is a critical uh, aspect that we need to pursue. The public interest has been the driving driver underneath our spectrum policy for decades, uh, focusing on ensuring that communities, uh, low-income communities, communities of color, and other have that opportunity to get connected is important, and ensuring that that technology is open is important, so that we all have a right and an ability to speak on these, on these networks. Um, I think as we, as we look forward to how we do that, making certain that we address digital equity concerns, as you raised in your opening statement, is an important step. Using auction revenues to advance that is important, and that doesn't have to compete with some of the other public interest uh, needs that I know a number of members on this committee are looking at. Well, thank you. Um, and then I wanted to ask uh, Ms. Stankoveg, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, when it comes to getting the most of our airwaves to promote the public interest, coordination is the key. And so NTIA and FCC's recent Spectrum Coordination Initiative certainly helps improve things. And, and we also reported legislation out of the committee requiring something similar last year. So my question to you is, why is spectrum coordination important globally? How can we, as the leading democracy in the world, aid in this effort? And would having a national spectrum strategy in place help? Thank you for the question. So um, in terms of making sure that we're available and, and, and participating in those discussions, when you move into new spectrum bands, the components that you need to do that are not readily available. So you need radios, you need filters, et cetera. And when you need those components, if the US doesn't have bands to put forward and the manufacturers are not aware of those, what ends up happening is other countries can then go into the void and, and put other bands in higher priority. So if the US does wanna be a leader here, early action, allows us even signaling ideas of which bands are under consideration and starting that process really is helpful for us to be able to identify those and make sure that that is happening at the international level as well. Well, thank you. And then, uh, Ms. Brown, unlicensed use of our airwaves offers enormous social and economic benefits and unlicensed airwaves help kids compete or complete, I should say, their homework as well as enable the advancements in healthcare uh, and other things. In addition, a recent report found that unlicensed spectrum contributes over $79 billion per year in economic value. So with these benefits in mind, what is the impact to consumers and innovators if the U.S. fails to free up additional airways for unlicensed use? Great question, thank you for the question. Um, let me elaborate a little bit on what my colleague, uh, Ms. Stan Cavage, said. Um, consumers benefit when we can lead in spectrum allocation and then we can lead in product development. So, for example, in the recent six gigahertz band, we were the first country to adopt that unlicensed band. We now have over 200 pieces of equipment that have been through the certification process, ranging from television sets, access points, laptops, smartphones, et cetera. Um, and all of that is happening here first. 
So we get the access to equipment and the innovation and the innovative new uses of unlicensed. And as we move forward, we're expecting to see a lot more deployment of uh, augmented reality and virtual reality types of devices um, in that band because we now have the room uh, to, to spectrally support those sorts of technologies. So tremendously important. Thank you. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman yields back. Uh, chair now recognizes uh, the ranking member, Mrs. Rogers, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. At our last, uh, uh, this is uh, beginning with Mr. Bergman. At our, our last hearing with NTI Administrator Davidson, I voiced my concerns with the FAA circumventing the established spectrum management process and pressuring wireless carriers into accepting more conditions on their spectrum licenses after the auction had concluded. Congress designated the FCC as a technical expert agency to make spectrum management decisions that are in the public interest and with the necessary authority to work through these types of concerns. Mr. Bergman, how can we move forward from this incident and rebuild trust in the spectrum decision-making process? Thank you so much for the question. You're focused on this issue. It's absolutely critical. Um, I think from a nearly universal set of perspectives, we can agree that the process broke down with the C-band altimeter um, debate. And, uh, it, you know, that's really unfortunate because we had the FCC and NTIA, who are our spectrum experts, you know, look at this issue, plan for an auction. You had wireless carriers invest tens of billions of dollars, over $80 billion, to um, purchase the rights to use this spectrum, and then had 11th or 13th hour objections to that. And uh, you know, that's, a, that's a tremendous challenge, and it, and it undermines that auction authority um, and our spectrum framework for making that, that spectrum available. So I, I think that you know, some of the things that, that we think about are improving coordination. I would applaud um, uh, Mr. Davidson, uh, Chairwoman Rosenworcel for their uh, spectrum coordination initiative. We think that's a, a very, very positive step. Um, we're encouraged that the coordination has improved and gotten much more engineering to engineering focused. It's really important that these be science-based decisions. We need to make sure that the concerns are raised early and that we plan for those concerns. One of the things that you know, we think about is a whole of government approach is so key so that we don't just identify concerns, but we can plan for priorities. We know that 5G is a priority. We want to plan for that because, of course, this is all about making sure that we achieve the benefits of 5G. It's about the $1.5 trillion to the economy, the 4.5 million new jobs that 5G stands to bring. So we really thank you and appreciate your focus on this issue. Thank you. Ms. Brown, over the last several years, the committee has taken action to ensure our communications network networks are secure and to continue American leadership in the wireless industry. International harmonization of spectrum policy can play an important role in encouraging trusted vendors to align with our economic and security interest. And the United States has historically been a leader in identifying what spectrum is coming down the pipeline. However, other countries like China seek to disrupt that leadership and offer a different vision with their spectrum interest in mind. What can we do to ensure continued US wireless leadership internationally, as well as continued economic growth and innovation by our trusted allies and partners? Thank you for the question. Uh, I think we're already doing it, and we need to just keep doing more of it. Um, this hearing is a great example. We need, as my colleagues have said, to identify spectrum pipeline, uh, to continue to advance our spectrum allocations in support of our largest technology ecosystems, namely Wi-Fi and 5G, and then leading into 6G. Um, and as a result of that, by taking action and, and uh, building consensus here, we uh, have enormous weight when we turn to face the international community. Um, we've seen that in the unlicensed space with the six gigahertz decision that the FCC made in 2020, where we have uh, uh, dozens and dozens of countries that are following the FCC's lead. So, uh, so moving quickly, being, uh, paying attention to it, getting the work done, very important, and uh, we need to keep doing more of it. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Uh, Stankavage, one of the major successes under the Trump administration was bringing together NTIA, FCC, and DOD to establish America's mid-band initiative teams, AMBIT, to identify and make 100 megahertz of mid-band spectrum for 5G. 
How does the U.S. compare to its international counterparts in the, the terms of spectrum availability, and what areas of spectrum policy should we be thinking about domestically to better position the United States at the international level? Thank you for the question. I would characterize it as there's different amounts and, and different use cases, and that's happening. You know, it sort of started in some of the leading markets and countries that wanted to make sure they were playing leadership roles moving forward, and, and the U.S. was the very first in terms of the high band spectrum that we made available. Um, we then saw the international community at the World Radio Conference come together on you know, which bands were going to be targeted globally and used, and they are following the U.S. lead. And so we are expecting to see a lot more 5G deployments in countries that have not made them to date. When we look at the bigger picture, we have to also see what continues, like 5G is not a point in time. So the standard was created in 3GPP. That will continue to evolve as we move toward 6G. And as that happens, we wanna make sure that we have spectrum available in the near term. So domestically, we should be thinking, what can we put into the spectrum pipeline for the near term? And also be looking at that over the longer term for 6G, how are we going to make sure that we have identified which area, which pieces of spectrum may be viable in the US and which ones we want the international market. So I would say near term, making sure we have the pipeline and longer term. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, I've gone over, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. General Lady yields back. Chair recognizes Mr. McNerney for five minutes. Well, thank the chairman. Um, uh, this is a, a really important subject to me personally, and I'm really glad you held it. Thank the witnesses. Uh, Ranking member Lada and I co-chair the Congressional Wi-Fi Caucus, and I've long advocated expanding unlicensed spectrum on our national spectrum strategy. But Mr. Geist, how do we ensure that the unlicensed spectrum is not Thanks. overlooked as a commercial interest push for more spectrum availability? Thank you, Mr. McNerney, for the question. Uh, the main way to do it is to recognize that the successful way to effectuate our spectrum policy is to make uh, a variety of access regimes available as we look at spectrum bands. Uh, as has been noted here, you know, the seven gigahertz band, that is, a, that is a great opportunity to expand on our unlicensed work. And so opening that band up, particularly the lower 125 megahertz, could present real opportunities to advance not only Wi-Fi 6, but help us evolve into Wi-Fi 7. But really keeping that mix of access regime, regimes available is what will be critical. Well, thank you. You, uh, you observed that uh, using artificial intelligence in, network fab in the network fabric was uh, identified by the Alliance for Telecommunications Industry Solutions. Uh, and this question goes to Ms. Brown, I'm sorry, um, uh, that using AI uh, has been identified by the Alliance for Telecommunication Industry, Industry Solution as the goal for 6G technology. How does that availability of licensed and unlicensed spectrum affect the United States' ability to compete with other nations in AI? Thank you for the question. Um, the, uh, it is widely expected that AI will be used uh, in 6G networks to a far greater extent than it is today. It's already in use in networks today, uh, but to a far greater extent. And I think by leading in, um, in 6G, uh, both in terms of what the vision and the use cases are and understanding how that impacts spectrum allocations, paying attention to those spectrum allocations and getting that work done uh, in, the, in a prompt way um, is going to ensure that U.S. innovation uh, will be first uh, in, these, in these new 6G uh, networks to come. So this is another um, sort of benefit of uh, paying attention to the spectrum allocation process and getting that work done uh, as quickly as possible. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, uh, Ms. Stankiewicz, uh, can AI be used to enhance spectrum utilization, spectrum efficiency? Thank you for the question. Uh, I think most of the AI that we see right now is actually, in, in terms of network, is to increase network performance, to make sure that the network is operating as well as it can be, and to continue to improve it. I think as you move forward towards edge computing and more 
pushing the compute aspects closer to the end user, we will see increased AI applications and allowing the benefits of the connectivity with the compute and AI to really maximize the overall benefits. Well, what are some of the real world problems in building uh, the next generation of wireless networks uh, that AI uh, can help address? I, I think mostly it's gonna be on the network performance in the near term, but I would not underscore what the applications will enable. Um, when you can look at uh, AI being able to, for instance, look at machine welds on a factory floor to make sure that the weld has been done correctly uh, at a way that no, no person could see the images. So it's the end user applications that AI will encourage when you combine with the connectivity. Um, but for the near term, I think it's mostly in terms of the network performance and really enhancing that overall performance. Well, thank you. That's a that's a, a viewpoint I hadn't thought of. Was looking at weldments uh, in in uh, in parts in the in the factory floor. Um, Mr. Bergman, uh, you discussed how the United States should replenish the spectrum pipeline, and how China has implemented mid band spectrum in the mid to upper frequencies of the four gigahertz band. How will American consumers and businesses be affected if other countries continue to innovate their spectrum offerings while the U.S. lags? Thank you so much for the question. Um, Mid-band spectrum is key to 5G because it provides the capacity that we need for new expanded capabilities, um, higher capacity, lower latency. And what that enables is a variety of benefits. It enables us to address concerns about the digital divide with new services like 5G for home. It enables us to address our nation's climate change goals as we start to integrate 5G into some of the highest emitting sectors in our economy. It enables us to be the home for innovation by bringing uh, topics like the one you were raising, AI or um, virtual reality and innovation in those industries here to the US. And so that's why it's so critical that we have mid-band spectrum to enable that continued growth. Gentlemen's time has expired. I'll yield back. Chair now recognizes Mr. Guthrie for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate the recognition and I appreciate everybody being here today. And uh, as you know, we're pushing against the September 30th deadline and I'm the co-chair with Ms. Matsui of the Spectrum Caucus. And I believe that making more spectrum available to non-federal users is critical, especially as 5G and other wireless technologies are being deployed in the United States. So my first question, Mr. Todd, um, how has making more spectrum available for commercial use bolstered our efforts to close the digital divide? Thank you for the question. So as a cooperative, uh, HTC is focused on, on serving all of our, our members equally and providing equal access to service. Uh, broadband expansion has allowed us to be able to expand into markets where uh, larger carriers may not have made broadband available. So uh, we've been able to see firsthand how bridging the digital divide can, can really affect and improve opportunities in rural communities. Uh, we've seen examples of, of hotspot deployments in community centers at the peak of COVID to be able to allow uh, households without access, access to broadband to come together at those locations to be able to connect. Uh, for us, it's all about the availability and usability of the spectrum to be able to make sure that as we continue to expand out, that folks have access as soon as they can uh, to broadband. We, uh, uh, some co-ops in our area are, are trying to expand broadband to areas that are underserved as well. Is, 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 that, is your focus mostly on areas that are underserved by, obviously the population areas are gonna be served by people who have the ability to go in and, and recover their investment. And are you focused on areas that aren't necessarily being able to recover investment? Yes, sir. Our expansion has been in the areas where we've been unable to recover investment through uh, traditional mechanisms. We've participated in uh, different programs, whether it be uh, state, federal uh, funding programs to uh, have access to grants mm -hmm. to expand into those areas. Um, and th those vehicles have been uh, very beneficial for us. Okay, thanks. That's good to know. Thank you. And then, um, Ms. Ms. Brown. Uh, Rep. Matsui and I have been working on legislation to reauthorize, reauthorize the FCC Spectrum Auction Authority. And beyond the 3 gigahertz band and the 2.5 gigahertz band, we are continuing to do our due diligence to determine what additional bands may be ripe for auction. 
And so, my question, Ms. Brown, are what are the benefits for Congress preserving its authority to, to direct the FCC to conduct certain auctions? Congress has, has played a leadership role for 30 years in identifying spectrum bans uh, and uh, providing direction to the FCC about what should happen next. And that is an invaluable uh, policy uh, direction that really helps drive consensus uh, across the FCC, NTIA, and other agencies. Um, I can't stress enough how important it is for you all to uh, help the spectrum community um, direct uh, direct the uh, the FCC on this important auction uh, program. Um, we uh, we have not uh, had for a long time auction authority without some direction in terms of what spectrum should be up next, and I encourage you to do that again this year. Okay, thank you, thank you, appreciate that, Mr. Bergman. Um, I agree with you about the importance of making spectrum available for exclusive use, particularly the mid-brand mid-band spectrum. One of the earlier mid-band auctions was the CBRS auction, which, as you know, granted priority access licenses to commercial users with coordination around the Department of Defense. We've also seen the 3.45 gigahertz uh, auction that granted flexible use licenses. Spectrum coordination is key for, uh, for successful operation sharing regimes. I've introduced the Smart Spectrum Act, which would require NTIA to establish an incumbent informing capability system for sharing spectrum between federal and non-federal users. So I'll get to my question in an efficient manner. So what are um, some lessons learned from the previous auctions like CBRS and the 3.445 gigahertz that can we need to take into effect as we look at the next spectrum? Thank you, Congressman Guthrie. Um, it is important that we be thinking about all tools uh, that we have available to us to to make more spectrum available. And, uh, and so we appreciate the focus there. I think for us, when we think about spectrum access, it's about certainty. Um, you know, our companies have made investments of about $30 billion per year um, in license access spectrum. And having that certainty is absolutely critical. So, you know, when we look at, um, you know, different spectrum sharing arrangements, you know, one of the challenges of the CBRS framework is the complexity. You know, it's more, um, it's more complex than any other country has, has deployed in, in that, you know, sort of critical area. Um, and we think about things like the power levels that can be used. Uh, and so, you know, for us, I think the market tells the story. If you look at the CBRS auction in, compared, in comparison to the um, C-band auction right above it or the 3.45 uh, band right below it, you see that the market valued um, that greater certainty that you had with exclusive use spectrum. And, you know, to a value of about four to one, um, well, you know, when you adjust for the amount of spectrum. And the reason is- Thank you. I think my time sort of expired, so I'll yield back. He was about to gavel me, so I'll go. I'll go. I heard him. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. There. Guthrie. Uh, uh, before we go to the next question, I want to recognize a former chairman that just uh, walked into the room. Joe Barton from the great state of Texas, and more importantly, the Republican manager of the congressional baseball team. Joe, good to see you. That's why I love you so much, Joe. <laughs> Glad to have you here, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Ms. Clark, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank our ranking member for convening this important hearing. Thank you to our witnesses for their testimony and for joining us uh, today. Greetings to everyone. Uh, as the COVID-19 pandemic has laid bare, the need for accessible broadband connectivity in both urban and rural areas is critical for underserved and marginalized populations to stay connected to essential online resources like education, remote learning, employment, remote work, healthcare services, telehealth, and as well as narrowing the digital divide. Many in these communities use mobile devices to participate in online activities such as virtual learning, which often requires high-speed network connections that aren't always accessible and or available. My first question uh, is for uh, Ms. Ms. Geis, Ms. excuse me, Mr. Geis. Mr. Geis, you've noted that a primary focus on public interest needs 
is necessary to fulfill the growing demand for spectrum resources. When competing ideas for public interest are at play, how can we ensure that spectrum policy decisions made in the public interest do not further entrench inequitable spectrum access for historically underserved communities? Uh, Representative Clark, it's a great question, and thank you for your leadership in this area. I know that we've worked together on a number of efforts to ensure that these communities get served. Um, it's critical, it's critical that we focus our policies on ensuring that we don't leave folks behind that we know traditionally get left behind. And so to advance those initiatives, you know, we've suggested uh, digital literacy uh, as one way to reach those communities, making certain that they have the skills and, and the tools necessary to, to get that access. We're obviously looking at all the money that Congress has put forward on a bipartisan basis to drive investment into these lower income communities in our, in our rural and urban areas uh, as a way to address that. Uh, and we're also looking at uh, the, F the authority that the FCC gave, uh, the, the Congress gave the FCC on a bipartisan basis to look at past digital discrimination to make certain that we bridge these gaps. Quick question, how do we create a maintenance of effort? is oftentimes we do these one-shot deals and um, you know it, it wanes over time. And these communities have been systemically discriminated against. Yeah. How do we uh, create within uh, the, 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 dy the dynamics before us a maintenance of effort? Yeah, it's, that, that's, that's a great, great question as well. You know, we've, in, in one context, we have a universal service program that provides continued funding. In this context, you know, we should look at auction revenues. This is a source of funding that is pretty substantial, uh, where we could endow a foundation uh, with some of these revenues, a portion of it, and say to them, here is your mission. Make certain that these communities' needs are addressed. Make certain that we focus those efforts. Uh, so we'd love to work with your office on, on trying to bridge that. Absolutely, and as a follow-up, in your testimony, you explained that revenue generated from spectrum auctions could support public interest needs. That being said, should we also be looking at how uh, we might uh, spectrum reallocations and auctions themselves be constructed to promote digital inclusion and increase access to the affordability of 5G connectivity for unserved and underserved communities? Uh, yes, absolutely. I mean, that's, that, that is the, the game here, right? We need to make certain that we're getting everybody, all Americans connected. Uh, and figuring out the tools to help them is critical. Wonderful, I thank you. Um, as the world goes wireless, the uses and demand for wireless connectivity and spectrum continue to increase rapidly. In recent years, the US has made enormous progress in unleashing spectrum, which has been allocated for both licensed and unlicensed use. Ms. Brown, in your testimony, you stated that the United States finds itself in the in inevitable, excuse me, an enviable position of being a technology leader in both unlicensed and licensed technology. As we replenish spectrum pipeline, is it critical that we use available spectrum bands as efficiently as possible, recognizing that what considerations should policy, re recognizing this, what considerations should policymakers take into account when evaluating the best methods for allowing new uses in the spectrum band? Well, the short answer to that question is yes, we should. Um, and I would uh, point by way of example to the FCC's uh, flexible uh, spectrum licensing program, which allows uh, operators to continually upgrade and change out the technology that they're using in the license spectrum that they have. That's a huge advantage that the United States has globally. Not all regulators do it, and we should encourage it. General Thank Lady's you. Time I has yield expired. back, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chair now recognizes Mr. Kinziger for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I wish I could be there with you all soon. Uh, and I appreciate all the witnesses for being here. Uh, we can all agree, and as most of us has publicly stated, that the United States has a vested interest in being the world leader in 5G tech and service. But I think it's also safe to say that the coordination of spectrum policy, which is absolutely vital to the effort to lead in 5G and beyond has been so far. Don't get me wrong, the FCC's auctions have been a major success, bringing in tens of billions in revenue to the federal government and allowing for efficient uses of commercial spectrum. But in the past five or six years alone, we've seen numerous disputes, intergovernmental, interindustrial, 
and government to industry disputes, which hamper overall effort and hit, and they're a bit embarrassing, frankly. Uh, what can the U? How can the U.S. be expected to lead when it has to grapple with turf wars and government and scaremongering from certain industries? It's my hope that we can all work together to overcome these challenges, reauthorize Spectrum, auction authorities, and remove unnecessary obstacles to Spectrum organization and efficiency. Uh, first question. Mr. Bergman, with the uh, demand for spectrum reaching all-time highs, what does Congress need to do to help direct more spectrum towards 5G and 6G? And what are the spectrum needs of the industry going to look like for uh, 6G? Thank you so much for the uh, question, Congressman. Um, I, I, think, uh, I think I can answer both of your questions with one answer, which is to say the key is for this committee to focus on extending the FCC's auction authority with a defined set of spectrum bands. because. That's what's critical for uh, advancing 5G, and it's also critical for addressing the coordination issues that you referenced. I mentioned earlier that uh, the FCC and NTIA are our spectrum uh, regulator experts. This committee is our nation's uh, spectrum expert as well, too. And we really look for this committee to lead in terms of defining those auctions. That plays a tremendous advantage in terms of moving quickly, and it also helps reduce some of those back-end problems uh, of coordination that we've seen more recently. Adam, are you still with us? There he is. Well. Adam, are you able to hear us? Uh, the wonders of modern technology. You want me to go to the next slide? I guess right here. Who's next, uh, Mr. Okay. Beast? You know what? Well, I'm going to recognize Mr. Yeah, Beast, and then we'll let Adam back on. I'm going to yield back if uh, he needs it. I'll yield back. Adam, are you there? <laughs> yeah. If you can hear me. I'll yield back. Yeah. Oh, okay. Gentleman yields back. Chair recognizes Mr. VC for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Um, and uh, as many of you know, uh, uh, just like the rest of the country, the Dallas Fort Worth area is experiencing a huge growth in, in technology companies. Uh, and we want to make sure that, uh, that we are collectively working together to ensure that low income communities uh, and communities of color across uh, the Metroplex, as we like to call it, uh, can benefit from some of the economic opportunities made possible. Uh, as we explore uh, the next wireless frontier. Uh, and that brings me to my next question uh, for Mr. Geis. Uh, can you elaborate how using a mix of access regimes uh, approach and exploring spectrum opportunities benefits low-income communities and communities of color as new technologies and services emerge? Yes, thank you very much for the question, uh, Congressman Vizi. Um, a mix of access regime what it does is it ensures that entrepreneurs, uh, uh, minority businesses, have the opportunity to explore um, getting access to Spectrum and Spectrum technologies on unlicensed networks without a huge upfront payment on Spectrum acquisition. So it creates those kind of opportunities. Um, in addition, you know, the FCC actually has a policy uh, given to it by this Congress uh, under Section 309 that it should structure its auctions in a way that encourages minority and women-owned businesses to participate. And as the FCC looks at structuring auctions, we encourage them to think about how design of that auction, particularly in terms of uh, spectrum service areas, may, may hinder that capability or that opportunity for women and minority-owned businesses. So we kind of push them, and, and we hope you'll push them, but um, it is that mix of access that entrepreneurs and innovators in the unlicensed space can, can obtain uh, market without having to go through the spectrum acquisition cost. And then those minority and women-owned businesses that, that can pursue opportunities in spectrum, the FCC should structure its au auction to encourage that participation. What can Congress do to help prioritize that to make sure everyone who wants and needs to be connected has equal access to the next generation technology? Uh, well, you, you know, Congress took a substantial step in the IIJA in bringing connectivity to these communities. Uh, the NTIA, as it rolls that program out, 
uh, needs to be rigorous in ensuring that the states are pursuing those opportunities where there are uh, you know, urban and rural divides that need to be bridged. Um, this is a once in a generation investment and we certainly are encouraging them to make certain that you know, through the mapping and other efforts, they are targeting these communities with those investments. Uh, uh, Ms. Ms. Stan Cabbage, I wanted to ask you a question. You know, as, as government and industries work together uh, in the U.S. to secure to secure the next generation and, and um, uh, uh, deployment, uh, we should be very intentional about advocating in the public uh, and recreating a robust workforce uh, pipeline. Uh, I wanted to to uh, to to ask you about uh, 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 Intel. Uh, and what initiatives has Intel taken to not only educate communities about the benefits of 5G and other uh, cutting edge technology, but also to recruit high school students and college students uh, of diverse backgrounds to join the technology workforce? Thank you very much for the question, uh, Congressman Vesey. So Intel takes workforce development very seriously. Um, we have a variety of programs. Uh, in Ohio, for instance, we are as part of our initiative there, making sure that we are um, doing workforce development as part of our Ohio rollout. But in addition, one of my colleagues is very active in uh, a program with AI, where we are making sure that AI for youth is really explaining the technology and helping. We also have programs at the community college level uh, that we used, and I, I believe uh, the First Lady Biden was just at one of the sites to look at that as well in, in Arizona to see what we're doing in that respect as well. So we do have, you know, for college students, for younger students, and what we're doing with workforce because we see it as absolutely critical to make sure we're prepared now and over the longer term. Uh, thank you very much. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. I now I'll yield five minutes to my fellow suffering Pittsburgh Pirate fan and friend, Gus Bularakis. Thank you, and let me just tell you, we have the number three farm system uh, in, 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 in baseball. There's no question, and it's a bright future. I, I guarantee it, Mr. Chairman. Uh, okay, in 2019, CTIA unveiled the idea of a national five-year spectrum plan. At that time, I said that this was a good idea to ensure a unified strategy among all agencies and federal partners to understand and achieve a defined goal. Since then, there have been well-publicized instances that prove federal agencies are not on the same page when it comes to spectrum strategy, unfortunately. And in some ways, this disharmony is an embarrassment for our functioning government. In my research, I found that uh, the country of Australia has uh, maintained a five-year spectrum plan since at least 2017. Their plan is publicly updated by annually, biannually with their uh, successes, failures, and status reports, which are then rolled into an updated five-year plan. The question is for Mr. Bergman. What would you say is the status of a unified American spectrum strategy? What a minimum, uh, what, what a minimum, at minimum, uh, should be included in a U.S. strategy on spectrum, and should we use Australia's spectrum plan as a model? Thank you, thank you, Congressman. Um, sure. You know, your your description of the focus on spectrum auctions and spectrum planning is really critical. And I think that's definitely something that we can benefit from and uh, incorporate here. Um, a national spectrum strategy is a key way to do that. We can plan for uh, auctions to have that pipeline of spectrum bands. Um, you can make sure that you're taking your most highly valued assets. You know, I've, I've talked a lot about mid-band spectrum. When we look at the portfolio of mid-band spectrum, um, we see that government is overweighted. Uh, DOD has access to two-thirds of the key mid-band spectrum. Um, we also look at the allocations between licensed and unlicensed, and you have today about 1,900 megahertz of that mid-band spectrum for unlicensed. Uh, you're at anywhere between 270 or 450 uh, today for licensed spectrum in that mid-band range. So we think it's really important that you make those kind of strategic decisions so that we have enough of the right assets coming to market. Um, I would also, again, encourage this committee, 
uh, as our spectrum experts, uh, you all can help with that spectrum pipeline uh, when you guys consider the FCC's auction authority and can provide some of that direction as well, too. Thank you very much. Uh, one issue I've been uh, pounding the desk on, and I'm not going to pound the desk, Mr. Chairman, on this getting uh, getting the NTIA uh, and the FCC to update the Memorandum of Understanding on Spectrum Coordination. This committee unanimously passed my bill, the Spectrum Coordination Act, which would do just that, and I appreciate it, Mr. Chairman, you putting that on the agenda. I'd love to see it uh, get on the floor of the House of Representatives as soon as possible. Prior to our last hearing, these two agencies put out a press release that they would uh, be working to update the MOU on their own. Mr. Bergman, again, have we heard anything beyond the press release on the status of this update? For instance, do we have a timeline for an updated agreement? Do we know what they're seeking to address to make this process better? And as a follow-up, again, we all know uh, uh, intimately the problems surrounding federal agencies with the last spectrum auction and licenses. So let's go ahead and get that, uh, that response from you first, please. Thank you so much. Uh, you're absolutely right to focus on coordination between agencies. We want NTIA and the FCC to be at the lead of that, so we certainly support your legislation and efforts to move that MOU forward. Um, do you think it's critical that, that all agencies um, uh, appreciate and recognize the goals that you talked about with the National Spectrum Strategy so that we have both NTIA and the FCC leading and the other agencies thinking about how do we support those goals so that we identify concerns early and we can plan for them? Thank you. Uh, so is there a better way to incorporate any federal agencies with shared spectrum or adjacent, spe adjacent spectrum in the pre-auction process to avoid these blunders without being uh, too burdensome, because that's important as well. What do you think? I, I think we do have uh, uh, existing processes through sort of intergovernmental coordination, and the key is that those processes broke down in, in the instance of the C-band. We need to have a, a recommitment to those coordination policies so that those concerns are addressed early What's at stake, right, is how quickly can we bring 5G to market? And how quickly can we bring 5G home to bear for the digital divide or connecting rural areas? How do we um, push innovation faster here in the U.S.? So I think it's really critical that we get that C-band spectrum online in, in July. And uh, we would definitely encourage this committee through your oversight role to make sure that those agencies are getting that feedback in as quickly as possible. Oh, Gentlemen's time has expired. Back. Uh, Chair now recognizes Mr. McEachin for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, to you and to Chairman Poel, and I thank you for convening today's hearing. Uh, Mr. Geis, I'd like to uh, start off with you and uh, just note that when we uh, did the development of wi wired broadband services in rural communities, uh, we found that it was critical to ensure that we knew what areas are served and what areas are not. And that's why I was privileged to help with the passage of the Broadband Data Act last Congress, which attempted to help improve how we collect data from wire, wireline providers for our broadband maps. But as you know, it's a little trickier with wireless providers. How do we make sure that we have accurate maps of which wireless providers serve which areas, and why is it important to get it right? Uh, thank you, Congressman McEachin, for the question, and, and thank you for your leadership on um, trying to secure support for devices so that we can get uh, folks in our low-income communities connected. Um, uh, we'll continue that work. Uh, the mapping question is a really good question. When we talk about wireless mapping, it is different and more difficult than a wireline map. Um, unfortunately, too often our maps have relied on sort of the uh, theoretical propagation characteristics. Uh, which leaves a lot of communities unserved but reported as served. Um, as we look at the rollout of 5G and the small cell technology that that technology relies on, it's going to be critical that we get that information right because the opportunities to miss communities in our urban sectors as well as communities in our rural sector um, are, are just vastly increased. Um, so, you know, let's, let's take a look at the actual technical opportunities, but also let's make certain that 
the crowdsourcing of data that we present as an opportunity to challenge those maps is available to consumers as well. So it can't be just a state-led effort. It can't be just a professional effort. We need true crowdsourcing because the opportunity for these technologies to miss communities are, are, are pretty great. Uh, uh, thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Bergman, uh, I'd like to talk to you about the, uh, the so-called last mile, if we can. Where do things stand currently in terms of the effectiveness of fixed wireless as a last mile option for our rural communities? And how do we ensure that spectrum remains available as we move forward with auctions? Thank you so much, Congressman, for the question. As we think about trying to meet our, our biggest challenges, like connecting 100% of, uh, of the population, which is the absolute right goal for this committee, I think mobile wireless is particularly well suited to um, make those connections. And, and so would applaud this committee for its focus on technological neutrality and the programs that you all have adopted. And we've seen with the success of programs like the Emergency Broadband Benefit, the Affordable Connectivity Program, two out of every three consumers choosing wireless. And we're really excited as we think about now fixed wireless for home broadband. Um, we see already our nationwide providers regional providers investing in fixed wireless, connecting tens of millions of homes already, and with the right spectrum, they have plans to connect together over 200 million homes. So we know that this can be a critical part of the equation because it can be, de be deployed quickly, um, in many cases can be uh, deployed more affordably, um, and it's gonna bring uh, choice to the home broadband market. So we're very, very excited about 5G home for wireless and, and appreciate this committee's focus on making sure that we've got the right spectrum to do that. Uh, thank you, sir. I thank all the witnesses, Mr. Chairman. I'm gonna give you a whole minute back. I yield back. <laughs> thank you, Mr. McEachin. Uh, Chair now recognizes uh, my good friend, Bill Johnson for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Todd, as co-chair of the 5G caucus, I'm focused on finding additional spectrum opportunities so that our nation's 5G network can be swiftly deployed. I'm pleased that FCC Chair Rosenworcel uh, recently announced that the FCC plans to start an auction for the 2.5 gigahertz band this July. This auction will make more spectrum available for 5G expansion, especially in rural parts of the country. But unfortunately, the FCC's auction authority is set to expire on September 30th. Something has, uh, like that has never happened since the FCC's auction authority was first enacted in the mid-90s. Please walk us through how this looming expiration might impact the preparation of uh, smaller carriers. Thank you for the question. Uh, from a small carrier perspective, not continuing auction authority would hinder our participation because we don't have the resources that larger regional national providers have. Okay. Mr. Bergman, uh, recently a technical disagreement in the C-band spectrum made national news. We all heard about it. As spectrum repurposing is becoming more difficult, we need to ensure our spectrum licensing system provides certainty to encourage investment in wireless technology. And we need to ensure that federal agencies are communicating, collaborating, and fully cooperating to ensure safety issues are addressed without disrupting the auction process. The C-band spectrum that was auctioned is a non-federal band. Can you explain how the FAA inserted itself into the process and whether they had a formal role in the reallocation process? Yeah, thank you very much for the question and the focus on the issue. Um, you know, I think we can all agree that the process broke down in the C-band altimeter discussions and caused unnecessary friction. Um, you know, we, we saw that when we look at how the rest of the world uses that band uh, at, at safely and has both 5G and, and safe flights. And so I think, uh, you know, it's absolutely critical that we learn from this lesson. Um, when we have companies that are willing to invest tens of billions of dollars to solve the digital divide, to bring jobs, um, it's absolutely critical that that, that process happen uh, smoothly. And, and I think you know the keys are, as you say, making sure that there's early agency input 
Um, the FCC and NTI do have a process where they share um, proposed, uh, proposed decisions and, and circulate those. Uh, I think the challenge here is um, that some of those aviation, or some of that aviation equipment um, listens outside of its band. Um, in, in the 5G world, we stay in our lane. We're very focused on providing service in our lane, but that aviation equipment listens outside of its band. And so, you know, when I, when I think about early planning, I think about not just raising concerns, but how do we plan for the future so that there are technology upgrades so that we yeah. can be more efficient with that spectrum. Back to those operative words, cooperate, communicate, and collaborate across agencies to make sure we address these questions up front. Uh, Mr. Bergman, continuing with you, the FCC was established by Congress to be the authoritative technical expert on spectrum matters. While the FAA stakeholders did not like the outcome of that proceeding, what is the long-term impact to the public's trust when Americans see federal agencies raising last-minute concerns after the auction, once concerns were already addressed by the so-called expert agencies. I mean, how can the American people trust what we're doing if we miss something this big? I would absolutely agree with you. I think we saw unnecessary friction in the aviation industry for consumers and, and certainly in the, in the wireless world as well, too. And we know that every six-month delay in 5G costs us $25 billion in the benefits that we hope to achieve from it. So it's absolutely critical that we solve these issues going forward. You bet. Uh, one last question for you, Mr. Bergman. I'll ask it quickly. One of the biggest auctions the FCC has ever conducted is the auction of the C-band spectrum, while the first 100 megahertz of the full 280 megahertz has been made available. The remaining 180 megahertz of the spectrum will be made available in phase two of the transition. As Congress examines whether and how to extend FCC authority to issue permits and licenses, what would be the impact to your industry if the FCC is unable to complete processing the phase two licenses? Uh, absolutely. Well, it, it's, um, it's absolutely critical that we bring <coughs> the spectrum, uh, that first phase uh, available in July, and it's critical that we move forward with phase two as well too. We know that's key to all those benefits that 5G will bring to us. Okay, so you're aware of it. Thank you, Mr. Gentlemen, Chairman. time has back. expired, and Chair now recognizes Mr. Soto for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In Central Florida and throughout the nation, Americans rely on spectrum for cell service, internet, social media, GPS, various apps from health to music. Uh, and that's why I was so excited about the 5G rollout. This was a tremendous accomplishment. We know there was balancing that had to happen between both cellular and aviation, uh, and those issues will continue to be resolved. And it's key that we work together, both through cellular and aviation and other areas, uh, as we go forward on C-band concerns that have been around for about four years, especially representing Central Florida, a, a tourism capital uh, with so much air traffic. Um, we happen to be able to do this because we work together, right, in public-private partnerships, government, uh, as well as private industries. And that's why it's so key for us to do the same thing as we open up a uh, new spectrum for auction, uh, which is why we're here today, to make sure we educate the American people on why it's key to extend the FCC's auction authority currently set to expire on uh, September 30th of this year. Uh, and what's at stake, uh, particularly mid-band spectrum, which is good signal, has a good signal range, it uh, is better indoors, it uh, helps with increased capacity, faster speeds, latency, uh, so many things that are key to make sure we have that crisp uh, cell phone connection. And so we have to continue this work together as we march towards 6G. You heard it, 6G next. Uh, to those of you at home are just catching up with 5G. Uh, artificial intelligence, virtual reality, machine learning, and other technological advances. Uh, 6G will be critical uh, to these for our economy, healthcare, national security, finance, entertainment, so many other issues. I'm glad it was brought up before about the American Competes Act and the CHIPS Act that's included in there because all this is together without the supplies for cell phones and so many other technological advances, we won't be able to let this happen. So I'm hopeful like with the infrastructure law and particularly with the recent budget that 
this committee and this Congress will come together to pass the America Competes Act with CHIPS Act fund funding. We're excited to make microchips in Central Florida and Neo City, and we're gonna keep uh, going forward on that. Uh, I'm also concerned about commercial space flight and streamlining uh, telecommunications with regard uh, to our rockets that go up literally every week, multiple times a week by SpaceX, Blue Origin, ULA, and of course, by NASA. So our Launches Act is something that we look forward to um, longer discussion on in the future. But for now, we know it's critical for FCC and NTIA to work together to develop positions on international spectrum issues. One, to help achieve global harmonization. Two, to make sure we're in the best position to capitalize on what the next generation of wireless technology has to offer. And three, to ensure timely commercialization of products for the U.S. market. Ms. Stankavage, why is it important to U.S.'s economic and security interests to play a leadership role in engaging the international community in spectrum policy? Thank you for the question, Congressman Soto. It, it is absolutely critical. Um, as I described, it's, we have to be early in the process to make sure that we have the components around it so that we're able to intercept the product and investment cycle to make sure that there is timely access. And that's true for licensed and unlicensed technologies. And when the U.S. does act quickly, what you see is the bands that the U.S. selects. We do have the equipment to support those. And then we're able to provide that equipment. And we're then able to capitalize on the economies of scale when other countries do as well. So rather waiting at the back of the queue, we're at the front of the queue. And then we're able to make sure we have the equipment and we have it at a, in a more cost-effective manner. Like in so many issues, it's critical for America to lead, and I appreciate that. Mr. Bergen, uh, much of the mid-spectrum is occupied by federal government agencies. Obviously, this is a sensitive area where we have to have careful balance. Do you have any recommendations on how we can determine what spectrum the government needs and uh, what can be reallocated? Absolutely. Thank you for the question and the focus on mid-band spectrum. You're absolutely right. Um, the federal government is overweighted in our mid-band spectrum portfolio. There are absolutely important missions there. Uh, the key is to find ways to be more efficient with the spectrum that we, that we use. Um, in the commercial wireless industry, we have strong incentives to constantly have new generations of technology that are more efficient with the spectrum. We've, we've increased our spectrum efficiency by 42 times in the last 10 years. The same incentives don't always exist for the federal government, so we need to find a way to make them more efficient so that they can do their important missions and we can reallocate spectrum for commercial use. And that's Gentlemen's why we're here today. Time has Thanks. expired. Uh, Chair now recognizes Mr. Long for five minutes. All right, folks, everybody together around here about to begin the auction. Hey, hey, beautiful day for an auction. And as you all know, it never rains on a Billy Long auction. There's always a cool breeze at about 40 degrees. But uh, very happy today to be here today selling the 2.5 gigahertz band. And uh, you all, uh, you, we've had your credit pre-approved and everything, so everyone's free to bid at will. All right, who get 25 billion? Hit 25, 25, what do you get 20? Somebody say something, 25, what do you get 15, 10? 10, 10 billion dollars, 2.5 gigahertz, come on now. All right, I have a five, six billion, six now, seven, seven, sir, you able to buy an eight, eight, what do you nine? Now we in and out, 10, 10, you able to buy 11 here, 11, 10 billion dollar, 11, 11, you want 11 out, 12, 11, 12, hit 13 billion, 14, 14 and a half, 13, 14 and a half, sold it 13 billion dollars to Chairman Doyle, they're 13 billion. Sir, if you will pay your bill at the door out there before you leave, that would be greatly appreciated. And uh, folks, I have a 31 year, had a 31 year career as an auctioneer before coming to Congress. And so I uh, know a little bit about auctions and that is the place that things happen. And uh, it's transparent, fair, and all equal to everyone. Everyone's free to bid. Auctioneering and spectrum benefits the American taxpayer and the federal government. In fact, it has the potential to raise significant funds, as you just witnessed here, with him paying $13 billion for that ban, uh, to the U.S. Treasury and for the congressional priorities, such as rural broadband deployment in places like my district in southwest Missouri. It's important for the FCC auction authority to be extended with language requiring some FCC auctions, even for a short term. Now, switching gears, uh, Ms. Brown, I'd like to ask you, upon identification by federal agencies, the FCC is required to auction spectrum in the lower three gigahertz band within the next seven years as NTIA looks to potentially relocate incumbent federal systems 
or to find a technical solution solution to sharing what is the uh, viability and visibility into broadband range for spectrum assignments and their use and how important is it that NTIA gets this information? Thank you for the question. It is critically important that NTI get the information about federal use in that band because three gigahertz is the most important 5G band, not just in the United States, but in the world, because it can get put to work immediately uh, to deliver 5G services. So I think one of the things that the Spectrum Innovation Act uh, does well is it does give uh, a timeline to NTIA and FCC to make up their minds but it also gives them flexibility uh, in the decision-making depend depending on what they find in the band and whether it can be moved or changed, modified, or whether it needs to stay put. So, um, uh, so I think uh, Congress is on the right track there. Thank you, and I'll go to Ms. Stancavage next. Under Chairman Pai's tenure, the FCC started the Spectrum Horizons proceeding to seek comment on how to unleash innovation and new technologies in spectrum above 95 gigahertz. How do you envision the future of these terahertz frequencies being used, and how is the rest of the world looking at possible uses for this spectrum? Thank you for the question, Congressman Long. Uh, so basically, when we look at this, it's about the capabilities that are enabled. So when you look at 4G, it was very human-centric what you did on your phone. With 5G, we, we added ultra-reliable low-latency computing and also for machine, massive machine-type communication, or IoT. Those extra capabilities are enabling businesses to get those same types of benefits. And now as we move into 6G, there is research and development going on for some of those that would require very, very large bandwidths, but very short range, which would be consistent with those bands for things like uh, positioning, very high accuracy positioning and sensor uses. So you wanna take advantage of the capabilities that the technology brings and what is able to be deployed there. So there is definite interest in a lot of different uh, research areas to look at those high bands. Okay, thank you. And I just want to make a note that if this 5.2 ends up bringing less than 13 billion, that they should hire me as their auctioneer next time. And being an auctioneer, I did my five minutes and two and a half minutes. So, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. I'm going to need an installment plan, Billy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, chair now recognizes Mr. O'Halloran for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate that. Uh, as we consider the future of the nation's spectrum allocation and American leadership in this frontier, I want to recognize that while making more mid-band spectrum available is important for American leadership on 5G deployment, it is also critical uh, for closing the digital divide in rural America. The spectrum decisions made, uh, uh, and I hope we get this done by September, end of December, September, the D made here in DC have the potential to vastly improve connectivity in Arizona and across rural America. Access to spectrum is a key part of unlocking the potential of wireless broadband in rural America and Indian country broadband is the lifeblood of the 21st century economy. It is critical to economic development, health, telehealth and education in rural areas. Ensuring our rural and tribal communities and the providers that serve them have access to the spectrum resources necessary is essential to closing the digital divide and making sure our rural schools, hospitals, and businesses are not left behind. In the past spectrum auctions, like the most recent 2.5 gigahertz, uh, the FCC uh, created a tribal priority window so that spectrum could be allocated to ensure uh, eligible federally recognized tribal governments as well as tribal communications providers were able to connect their communities. This presented a landmark opportunity for tribal nations to gain access to spectrum to better serve their communities. Um, Mr. Jice, Jice, I know you're working with tribal nations before uh, and including the Gila River Indian community in the southern part of my district. Can you discuss what else Congress should be considering to make sure that tribal communities can get the
the best wireless service as possible? Uh, thank you, Congressman O'Halloran, for the question. And it was an honor to, to serve Gila River uh, for the years in which I did that. Uh, what it did give me an awareness of was just how difficult the challenge is of bridging the divide uh, in our tribal communities. Um, what Congress can do is what you did, uh, you know, promote the opportunity for tribal windows when spectrum becomes available. Uh, make certain that there's sufficient time for those tribal communities to apply for that window. So we appreciate your leadership on that, that work. But as Congress looks at spectrum opportunities, it needs to recognize the sovereignty of our tribal nations. And that sovereignty means that they should have some input into the destiny of the wireless spectrum that runs over their lands. Uh, so that's, that's sort of what the tribal window uh, created. Um, and uh, as we move forward on all spectrum bands, we think that's a good policy for the FCC to look through. In addition, the FCC can look at tribal bidding credits and how to reform those to better utilize them, as well as disaggregation of spectrum license areas so that tribal communities can build the networks on their lands where a provider has the, has the area, but not the will to build. So uh, I look forward to working with your office on these issues. Public knowledge is, a, is an advocate for our tribal communities to make certain that they have affordable access because as you know, they are some of the least served communities in, our, in, in the country. Well, thank you very much. Uh, in the FCC's auction for citizens broadband radio service, more than 200 bidders won over 20,000 licenses, including many entities like wireless internet service providers and tribes. Uh, Mr. Tad, why so many bidders, uh, or why so many bidders were able to win the spectrum in the auction? What lessons can we learn from it? How and how can we ensure rural providers are able to meaningfully produce and participate in the future auctions? Thank you for the question. So as, as a small provider, having access to smaller license areas is critical for small providers to be able to participate in auctions. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, as a small provider, we have limited resources. Uh, I would expect this to be a similar situation for other providers as well, uh, where we don't have the resources that larger providers have to participate in auctions on a larger scale as well as larger uh, sizes of spectrum. So for us, having usable spectrum uh, that's available, uh, that has OEM equipment that we can uh, roll out, uh, that definitely supports consumer choice and competition in those areas. Gentlemen's time much, has Jeff. expired. Uh, chair now recognizes Mr. Carter for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank all of the witnesses for being here today. Ms. Brown, I want to start with you, if you will. Um, during the pandemic, as we all know, uh, Americans relied on, on Wi-Fi for work, school, and, and so many other things. In fact, I, I was reading a book the other day that said that the average teenager um, you, was on the internet five hours a day more during the pandemic than they were before. It's just unbelievable to me that that um, it's that that that, that is true, it, and it, that we're on the internet so much, but. What I wanted to ask you is unlicensed spectrum plays a crucial role, as we all know, in enabling Wi-Fi technologies. And under the last administration, the FCC made an unprecedented amount of unlicensed spectrum available for commercial use. Do you think that's gonna be enough to keep up with all the new data rich applications that, that Americans use today? I mean, all of us are on the internet. I, I'm, I'm hunkered down now and, and using it virtually. and do you think that's going to be enough to, to accommodate all of us? Well, thank you for the question. Um, over the long term, it probably won't be enough. Um, but I think uh, for, the, for the immediate term, industry is already rolling out innovative new technology on the 6 gigahertz band. And we're looking forward in a couple of years to a second generation of technology coming into that to the six gigahertz band, a, a technology known as Wi-Fi 7 uh, will be coming our way in about two years time. Um, but that said, uh, the if demand continues to go up, and we expect it will with AR and VR and other sorts of technologies, uh, over time we do need to look for other opportunities. 
um, including uh, perhaps uh, spectrum at the very low end of the seven gigahertz range or other places where we could, uh, we could expand Wi-Fi technology. Okay, let me, let me ask you something else. There's a little known research in, in engineering arm of the NTIA that's in Boulder, Colorado. And I believe that this expert facility is being underutilized given the level of expertise it has. So I recently introduced a bill, the Institute for Telecommunication Science, Scientists Codification Act. This bill would give the ITS statutory authority to continue its work with a focus on establishing an initiative to support the development of emergency communication and tracking technologies where conventional radio communication is limited. Ms. Brown, would you um, elaborate on what makes the people in Boulder so uniquely positioned to enable collaboration on next generation spectrum technologies? Yes, thank you. Um, yes, the Boulder Lab is a national treasure. Uh, it is the place where radar was invented in World War II, and it has a long and distinguished career in uh, spectrum sciences. Um, I think uh, uh, innovations like your bill that would enable that lab to work on commercial issues around sharing and adjacencies would be welcome. Uh, it struck me as uh, very astonishing that we got so far down the road in C-band uh, debate uh, without actually having facts on the ground about what the altimeters could or couldn't do and uh, the degree to which uh, interference might uh, arise. Uh, it wasn't actually until this fall that we started seeing facts pop out on that. And I, I noted this week there was an article in the, uh, one of the national, national newspapers about Boulder getting involved in actual measurements uh, using DOD funding. So uh, yes, more, uh, more flexibility and more funding for that lab would, I think, really help us with uh, mitigating the kinds of issues we've seen in spectrum allocation. Thank you, Ms. Brown. I appreciate that. Mr. Bergman, I want to ask you real quickly. I, I have the honor and privilege of representing the first district of Georgia. And we, uh, whereas it is, it includes the entire coast of Georgia, it also includes a lot of rural areas. And getting broadband to those parts of the state is, is really important in my constituents for a number of reasons, work, learning, entertainment, whatever. I understand that the future of 5G is more than just mobile, but there will be a fixed component to it. And and that your members will offer home broadband services with 5G. Would you tell me what it would mean for rural Americans? Um, will they have access to these 5G home broadband services? Yeah, thank you for the focus on fixed wireless for 5G home. It's an absolutely key growth area and our companies, national, regional, are all investing in it. We see them covering um, tens of millions of homes today. Together, they'll cover over 200 million homes over just the next couple of years. Um, the key, I think, for this committee is you all have just made an enormous investment in making sure that everyone is connected with the $40 billion through the infrastructure legislation. Fixed wireless can play a key role there by going faster and providing the full complement of services that this committee is looking for. These services can provide 100 megabits down, 20 megabits up, and are, are really key for connecting everyone faster, more cheaply, and bringing competitive choice to the home broadband market. Thank you, Mr. Bergman, and thank you, Mr. Chair, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Uh, Chair recognizes Congresswoman Rice for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just want to thank uh, our colleague, Mr. Bilirakis, for raising the issue of the um, importance of the MOU between the NTIA and the FCC, and I think it's really, really important that it be fixed. Um, everyone's acknowledged that maybe it's not where it needs to be, um, and I think that's really important. Um, government and industry working together has allowed the U.S. to be the global leader in new and emerging wireless technology. We were the first nation with widespread 4G coverage, leading to countless innovations here in the U.S., including the development of the app economy. Now, with the emergence of 5G and next-generation Wi-Fi capabilities, the U.S. can build um, on this leadership record, grow our economy, and be on the forefront of technological innovation for the good of communities everywhere. Uh, Mr. Geis, you mentioned the importance of coordinated spectrum management. It seems that recent spectrum disputes involved uh, parties that questioned 
the finality of the FCC's decisions? How can Congress ensure that parties with interest in a spectrum band are able to have their voices heard early in the process and at the same time allow FCC to reach a final decision that everyone can count on in making investment and development decisions? Thank you so much, Congresswoman. It's a great question. And, uh, you know, as this committee and as the chairman and ranking member have highlighted, uh, reinforcing that interagency process and insisting on it being followed is the best step. And the oversight of this committee on that process is extremely helpful in producing that finality. So I encourage this committee to stay very active on that uh, with members around, the, around Congress that, that are quite often approached uh, uh, by private entities and on behalf of some of the federal agencies that they regulate uh, to get involved in this process. So it is a difficult one to to fix. Uh, that said, you know, there is a public process that is run, and these entities, these private entities, the, the government agencies, should all participate fully in bringing those, that information to the record so that we can make an evidence-based decision. I think as Ms. Brown testified, you know, it's, it's a sad fact that at the end of the process, in fact, after the process was done, that we learned that there were these concerns with the altimeters in the, in the C-band. Um, that's just un inexcusable. There was an opportunity for a public record and for data to be submitted to, to take into account those concerns. Um, and so that's sort of how we fix it. We, we have to insist on not only that public participation, but at the end when the decision has been made uh, in coordination with NTIA and the FCC to go forward with these spectrum auctions, uh, that that finality is insisted upon and that there's given no quarter for those voices that come in after the fact to try to disrupt it. Mm -hmm. Ms. Brown, can you explain how disputes over spectrum uh, delay deployment of new technologies? Yes, um, probably the, the principal case of delay involves the transportation spectrum at the top end of the five gigahertz band, um, which uh, has lingered now for some years. Um, the FCC, uh, uh, a few years ago, a couple years ago, had decided that uh, that some of that spectrum should be made available for Wi-Fi and uh, cut back the amount of transportation spectrum. That continues to be disputed by the transportation industry, which would like um, more spectrum available for uh, communications networking of vehicles on the road for safety purposes, et cetera. But that's a, a prime case where the user community in the transportation sector and, uh, and the FCC had different visions for the same spectrum. So now we're waiting around for a court case that will be resolved soon uh, that will tell us uh, what the future of that band is. Uh, and I certainly hope that once that is resolved, and if it is resolved in the FCC's favor, um, that uh, the FCC can promptly go forward and DOT can promptly go forward with implementing uh, transportation solutions in the spectrum that is, that is left for, for ITS. Thank you. Thank you to all the witnesses, and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Gentlewoman yields back. Chair recognizes Congress, Congresswoman Eshoo for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing. Um, let me begin by uh, uh, addressing um, something to Mr. Bergman. Uh, I, I thought that Mr. Carter asked you a very good question, and I was very anxious to uh, hear your answer, but I didn't hear it. Um, the most recent annual speed test by uh, PC Mag found that uh, Verizon and AT&T's 5G speeds in several cities are comparable or sometimes even slower than their 4G speeds. Uh, to make matters worse, consumers sometimes have to pay more for 5G by upgrading their device or their plan. Now, I do understand that there are reasons that uh, speeds aren't optimal yet relative to, uh, to 5G. Uh, but this practice of advertising uh, faster speeds, and yes, I did watch the Super Bowl and, along with millions of others, and one ad after another about complete 5G across the country, uh, you know, uh, all that advertising and charging for it uh, while delivering lower speeds 
it, it seems to me like a highly misleading practice to me. So my question is simple. Why are Americans paying more for slower wireless speeds? And uh, if you could just be, uh, you know, condense your answer. Absolutely. Uh, well, thank, thank you for the question, Congresswoman. I'm glad to have a chance to, really? to answer thank it. Thank you. I know it's a tough one. So thank you for saying thank you to a tough question. Well, yeah. Um, so I'd highlight a couple of things. One, we continue to see wireless speeds go up year after year. Um, they're up 85 times since 2010, up 360% since 2018. Yeah, but, uh, uh, 2010 was 12 years ago. So I, I, don't, I don't know. Um, uh, did, you, did you, let me ask this. Did you uh, 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 read this article? Are you aware I, of the article? I, 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 I have mean, not seen that article, but I, I know that speeds continue to go up year, year over year and prices continue to go down year after year in the wireless market. And so well, we think uh, it's critical that consumers have accurate information about what they're purchasing. So I would absolutely agree with you about that. But we're incredibly excited about the uh, advancements in speed that we see from competition and, uh, and the increasing value that we see for consumers. Yeah, well, I uh, I appreciate your words, but they're uh, they really don't. Uh, you're not answering the question that I pose. Uh, there's heavy advertising, uh, but what's being advertised is not so. It just isn't so, and uh, it can be documented that it's not so. And consumers are, uh, uh, you know, are uh, being told that they. Uh, uh, well, the advertising simply is misleading, but I, I understand why you don't want to acknowledge it uh, because it's uncomfortable to. Uh, but I think the problem uh, remains. Uh, going to Mr. Goyce, um, I, I appreciate your view that Congress, uh, you know, should ensure that spectrum proceeds are uh, obviously used in the in the public interest. Uh, one of the uh, one of the issues that I've been on for oh my goodness, decade and a half, uh, is uh, Next Gen 911. Uh, is there anyone on the panel that thinks that uh, uh, that 911, uh, Next Gen 911, uh, should not be a part of the, uh, uh, the proceeds of um, uh, future uh, auctions? Is there anyone that doesn't think that? You could raise your hand. And just to remind everyone, these are our this is our public safety system, and I think that once and for all, uh, we really need to address this and make sure that uh, uh, that every community, uh, whether they're rural, suburban, urban, uh, that we have a solid system for law enforcement, uh, for firefighters. Uh, we owe that to the American people. They dial nine one one. They need someone to answer. So uh, I really look forward to uh, making sure that Spectrum funds, uh, part of uh, those funds, uh, actually go to 911. Um, it's music to my ears to hear so many members and witnesses talking about unlicensed. I've been on that for a long, long time. So uh, I'm not going to spend any time uh, on it or ask questions because uh, I just want to highlight. Uh, that it's a delight that everyone knows, especially members of uh, high value of uh, unlicensed, because it is the innovation platform. Uh, so with General Lady's down, time has uh, expired. Yield back, uh, my two seconds. I thank the General Lady. Uh, Mr. Curtis, welcome. You have five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Ranking Member and our committee members. Um, I'm just going to climb up on a soapbox for half a second, and then I'll ask some questions. And it's really dealing with the rollout of, of C-band and, and the, the concerns uh, that we saw with that. I think we all understand that the, the stakeholders need to be involved, but doing that up on the front end, and it, it just feels like if we're really going to beat our competitors, primarily China at this game, that we, we got to be better on our, on, on our game than that. Now, let me climb off the soapbox and, and talk about my district just a little bit. Um, I have a very rural district. I like to laugh at my colleagues back east that say they have rural, and it would invite them out to Utah to see uh, real rural. And uh, my definition of rural is you have to drive three hours without seeing a structure. Um, and that's how my district is. I've got uh, vast amounts of, of rural parts of Utah, 
got the Na uh, Navajo Indian Reservation, and wanted to just touch on that, uh, Mr. Bergman, for a second. The, currently, the Indian tribes have been given, given priority in the 2.5 gigahertz spectrum uh, rollout. And uh, yeah, I'm glad. I mean, right, we've got to help these good people imagine. Uh, I've got uh, some people without running water, electricity, let alone broadband in, in parts of this part of my district. Um, and we all know, uh, and then I think the intention is to eventually have the, the rest of the auction, and we all know how we've talked about in this hearing how important these auctions are. But I'm a little concerned uh, that supply chain issues, uh, there could be a, a delay out of the, of the raw to the tribal nations, and then separately a, a delay in the auction. So Mr. Bergman, given the supply chain issues, do we expect any delays to build out in the tribal lands, and what challenges do you see? So, so thank you, Congressman, and, and you're absolutely right. The challenges that tribes face, I think, are unique and, and uh, incredibly difficult. I think the 2.5 auction is a sort of key part of that, and so would encourage the committee to, to move forward with extending auction authority. Um, particularly when you think about deployment challenges, uh, certainly supply chain challenges, I think, are something that's felt broadly across the economy, and we encourage the committee to think about things that we can do there. Um, and we need to be creative. Uh, the funding that, that this committee made available through the Infrastructure uh, Act will play a key role focused on tribal areas. And we need to think about things like siting. How do we make sure that we go faster on federal lands? How do we help tribes move more quickly? So it really is an all of the above uh, approach for tribal yeah. areas. Um, so could you comment about this issue of delaying the auction? And um, if, if that happens, uh, will it expire? And, and what would that do to the whole 5G rollout? In our 30 years of FCC auction authority, we've never had it expire. Um, it, it's really critical that we have auction authority as we're heading into a set of auctions because we want bidders to have certainty so that they know that they'll be able to use those licenses that they're stepping up to invest in. So you tell me, don't worry. We, we definitely need to make sure that auction authority okay, is extended. Okay, good, good. I'm with you on that. Um, well, I'm uh, on you, let me ask you about national spectrum strategy. Is it a good option? Uh, if so, how do we, uh, which, you know, which agencies and things like that help us walk us through how we, we do that successfully? Absolutely. I think it'll play a key role. Yeah, and I think you've heard a little bit today about the challenges of spectrum coordination recently. Uh, it, we need to have agencies coordinating, we need to have agencies sharing data, um, and we need the FCC and NTIA at the front of that, and would encourage this committee to take an important role as well too, because you all recognize the importance of spectrum, can help make sure that our spectrum policies reflect our national priorities. Can you just touch on balancing commercial and government interest? Um, Absolutely, it's, uh, you know, particularly when we think about mid-band spectrum, which is this key ingredient for 5G, our, our portfolio of mid-band spectrum is overweighted towards government today. We know that the, the U.S. government is the primary user of mid-band spectrum. DOD has access to nearly two-thirds of those critical mid-band frequencies. We need to find ways to be more efficient and get those federal government missions done and make more spectrum available for 5G. Yeah, it's actually been pretty incredible, the innovation, right, that's come about and how we use spectrum. And I think... In the wireless industry, we invest in tens of billions of dollars every year to have new generations of technology to be more efficient, we need to make sure we're doing the same thing on the government side too. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Stankovic, uh, the U.S. prepares, as the U.S. prepares for the next World Radio Communication Conference, how can Congress be supportive, right? And uh, how do we continue to show American leadership? Thank you for the question, Mr. Congressman. Um, I think the most important thing is to make sure that the U.S. Is an, is an early actor, that we're identifying early which bands are potentially available and then following through into the commercialization process so that it's very clear where we are going with this. And anything Congress can do to support in terms of identifying spectrum early opportunities and then making sure that it follows through would be really welcome. Good. Gentlemen's time has expired. Thank you, I yield, Mr. Chairman. Chair now recognizes Ms. Matsui for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and as co-chair of the Congressional Spectrum Caucus, along with Mr. Guthrie, I want to thank you for holding this important hearing. Um, spectrum governance is a fundamental part of sustaining America's competitive edge in the 21st century. From 5 and 6, Wi-Fi 6, and a satellite broadband, it's important that the federal government is speaking with one voice to move us forward. Um, I have a question regarding um, spectrum pipeline. To ensure 
that the United States remains a global pace setter and wireless communications technology, a reliable pipeline of spectrum is needed. But we have exciting opportunities coming up in the 2.5 and 3 gigahertz bands. Beyond that, the picture becomes less clear. I believe the 7 gigahertz band presents a meaningful opportunity to keep our pipelines uh, strong. However, given the amount of federal users in that band, we need to proceed carefully with a whole of government approach. And that's why I sent a letter to NTI Administrator Davidson yesterday, urging him to commit to finishing the 2019 study on 7 gigahertz. Uh, Mr. Geis and Mr. Bergman, can you describe the characteristics of the 7 gigahertz band, how they might be put to use to support commercial operations? Thank you, Congresswoman Matsui, and thank you for your leadership on spectrum issues. You've really been a great asset for everybody to have on these issues. What I would say is that this is another example where uh, mixed access regimes will be beneficial to the outcome. You know, what we learned in CBRS uh, was that based on spectrum coordination over a period of years, four to five years of coordination, hearing the agencies out and, and, and working through the NTIA and FCC interagency process, only after that period of hearing folks and, and really taking in their perspective, did we get to a situation where we could utilize the most of that band in seven gigahertz okay. where they're very sensitive military systems and a real need for DOD to have its voice heard through the NTIA process. Only by doing that can we, can we really utilize this band to its fullest potential. Uh, like I indicated, okay, I think the lower seven, mega, lower seven gigahertz is a real opportunity for unlicensed, uh, but we do see that there might be licensed opportunities. But I think only by going in with that sort of open mind for ver a variety of access regimes can we get the federal agencies to really focus on what the realm of the possible is for that band. Okay, certainly. Uh, and Mr. Bergman, do you have any more comments on that? Thank you, Congresswoman. We, we certainly appreciate your leadership on, on spectrum issues. Thank you for your uh, letter today on focused on the seven gigahertz band. Um, we, we've talked a lot about the importance of mid-band and the seven gigahertz band is a huge band. It's 1300 megahertz. Um, as you've heard, there are important uh, federal systems there, but there are also opportunities to be more efficient with how we use that spectrum so we would uh, certainly uh, encourage and, and follow your lead in terms of, you know, asking our federal government policy, uh, policymakers to look at how we can uh, make some of that spectrum available. Um, we know that that spectrum has been under study since 2019, mm -hmm. and uh, and there are real opportunities there for licensed spectrum. So thank you for your uh, your leadership on that. We'd love to continue working with you to uh, to see that included in a spectrum pipeline bill. Certainly, thank you. And um, in September of this year, the FCC's auction authority <clears throat> is set to expire. This authority underpins America's ability to really bring new spectrum to market and stay ahead of the other countries in the race to 5G and beyond. Extending this authority can and should be bipartisan and with implications for the next 2.5 gigahertz auction, it should happen as soon as possible. Um, Mr. Geis, do you believe, and I his question was asked somewhat before, do you believe tying auction revenue to investments and things like next gen 911 would be 911 would be a useful way to help modernize America's communications infrastructure? Uh, yes. Um, over the over the last decades, what we've seen is that auction revenues can be substantial, and they should be put to use to advance our public interest needs. NG 911. Uh, is a critical need. Uh, Congress had looked at providing some of that funding as part of the IAJA. Unfortunately, that didn't get there. So if we need to use auction revenues to do that, let's do that. And let's also think about digital equity. Okay, fine. And Mr. Bergman, how can extending auction authority quickly increase the likelihood of a successful 2.5 auction? And I think I've run out of time, but maybe you can make a couple comments. I would, I would five say, second comments. I'd say quickly, you know, auctions are the bedrock of our mobile wireless networks, including mm -hmm. 5G. And uh, bidders in auctions need to have certainty about getting access to spectrum. So getting that auction authority extended is really critical. Who's that? Okay. Thank you. General, General Lady's time has expired. Uh, gentlemen, uh, 
chair recognizes uh, Congressman Welsh for five minutes. Peter, can you hear us? Well, I can see his video, but I don't think he's, he can hear us. Hi. Okay, Peter, you're, you have five I, minutes. I, uh, thank you. I am having sketchy uh, in and out internet, so if I uh, go off, Mr. Chairman, you know what to do. You have 5G uh, up know, there, Peter? Uh, I had a <laughs> question similar to uh, Congresswoman Matsui, but I, I, I want to ask Mr. Guiche, do you agree with Chairman, Chairwoman Rosenworcel's proposal uh, to use auction proceeds to fund NG 911 deployment? Uh, is there much precedent for allocating auction proceeds to fund public interest projects uh, like that? Uh, thank you, Congressman Welch. Yes, we do support it. We think it can be a nice complement uh, to our drive to make certain that auction revenues are being used for public interest needs as opposed to flowing into the general tre treasury and, and, and leaving the sector. Uh, so yes, to NG911 for sure, and there is precedent. Um, under the first net, uh, uh, back in 2012, uh, Congress designated auction revenues to fund that network. Can you hear us, Peter? Uh, you know, Mr. Chairman, it's sketchy in and out, so I'm gonna spare you and uh, yield back. And have confidence that you'll handle this on my behalf. Okay, gentleman yields back. Chair recognizes Congressman Cardenas for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, Ranking Member Lada for holding this very, very important uh, hearing. I think it's really important for people to understand that what we're talking about is quite invisible to the American people. But at the same time, as you've heard from all these experts today, it is incredibly critical for um, not only the livelihood, but the education and the health of uh, people across America. Um, so with that, I'd like to ask uh, uh, Mr. Guys, um, Wi-Fi is the most heavily used wireless technology in the world and was born in the U.S. Uh, consumers, schools, and uh, businesses rely on it for more now than ever before. What actions can Congress and the administration take to continue advancing the development of Wi-Fi here in the United States? Uh, thank you, Congressman Cardenas. Um, yeah, it's important that we continue to provide spectrum access opportunities for Wi-Fi. Um, it is a key connection point, as, as Ms. Brown recognized, uh, you know, whether you're on a 5G network or a fixed network, if you're in your home, you're likely going through a, through a Wi-Fi network. And so making certain that there's sufficient spectrum to make that a meaningful connection is important. As I mentioned earlier, I think the seven gigahertz uh, spectrum offers a real opportunity to build on what we did in six gigahertz. And so we look forward to working with you and this committee to make sure that advances. Uh, speaking of six gigahertz, in your testimony, you support the FCC's recent decision to open up the 5.9 and six gigahertz bands for unlicensed use. What's the next spectrum bands that the FCC should consider for unlicensed use? Thank you. I think uh, I, I think that opportunity really is in uh, likely in the seven gigahertz band. It is adjacent to what's going on in six. It would give us an opportunity to take the 180 megahertz channel and increase it to 360 megahertz, which is gonna be critical for Wi-Fi 7. Uh, so we look forward to that as a real opportunity. And what, what should we expect to do? What should we call on ourselves to do to make sure that uh, rural communities and communities of color, uh, uh, tribal lands, et cetera, uh, uh, don't fall behind on current and future Wi-Fi technologies as they become available? Uh, yeah, it's a great uh, opportunity for this committee to look at a mix of, 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 um, of policies to promote. You know, we can, we can talk about digital literacy to make certain that our um, low income and communities of color uh, have the skills necessary and the tools to make the connection uh, to broadband, be it wireless or wireline. 
Um, I think for our tribal communities, pursuing the tribal priority windows when we look at uh, spectrum auctions is a critical step uh, and in recognition of their sovereignty. And I think just making certain that we understand where service is and is not available is critical. And like I mentioned in the 5G space, making certain that we have crowdsourced data to ensure that these small cells that are operating in our 5G are delivering 5G technologies are being delivered to our rural and urban uh, corridors um, so that those, uh, those communities that live in those um, have opportunities to get that access. So Mr. Guy is gonna take a true public-private partnership to make sure that we uh, don't leave people behind. Absolutely, that is gonna be critical. These are quite often communities that are vulnerable and they are highly dependent on government making certain that their needs are represented in policy. Uh, they don't quite have the lobbying capabilities of some of our larger companies, uh, and so it's incumbent upon uh, on, on members like you uh, to represent those needs. Is there a battle of the bands going out there, Mr. Guys, when it comes to public safety, et cetera? I know that it was mentioned more than once about uh, the Department of Defense having a large uh, segment of, of uh, spectrum within their, their uh, purview. So look, the government needs the spectrum that it needs, and we want to be respectful of that. But we do believe with others on this panel that there can be more efficient use of that spectrum. The key is going to be working through a collaborative process with those agencies and the direction of this committee that there are certain bands of spectrum that need to be thought of as coming online for commercialization to further those opportunities. But if we approach it in a collaborative and cooperative spirit and really listen to their concerns, I think we have a real opportunity to open up more of this spectrum and to accommodate their needs, be it licensed or where a government agency needs to stay through sharing uh, open access spectrum opportunities. All of that needs to be on the table and they need to feel comfortable coming forward in an environment where those interests will be respected. Gentlemen's time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. So I think we've gone through our committee members, and I see my good friend and fellow Pennsylvanian, uh, Mr. Joyce, who is waving on, and I yield you five minutes, sir. Thank you, Chairman Doyle, another Pennsylvanian, and Ranking Member Lada for allowing me to wave on to this important communication and technology subcommittee hearing. And thanks to all of the witnesses for appearing with us here today. Spectrum is vital in ensuring the connectivity for all Americans, especially the constituents in my district in Pennsylvania. Mr. Todd, how would you have a national spectrum strategy or certainty about what spectrum bands the FCC intends to auction help increase participation by regional providers like HTC? Thank you for the question. So for HTC, having a plan allows us to better prepare and plan and have an understanding of what spectrum would be allowed to be able to support in the areas that we serve. So for us, it means uh, faster expansion of access to areas that need service. And that expansion to access is so important within my district in Pennsylvania. My constituents are looking forward to this being present. Mr. Bergman, Wireless carriers utilize low, mid, and high band spectrum in different ways, but recent focus has been placed on making mid band spectrum available. How should Congress be thinking about these various spectrum bands as we consider how best to keep the pipeline full? Thank you, Congressman, that's exactly right. The focus for 5G right now is on mid band spectrum. Um, and you know we would urge this committee to move forward with a series of directed auctions uh, to create a, a pipeline of mid-band spectrum for 5G and then for 6G. Um, there, are, there are candidate bands that, that we talked about a little bit, the lower three gigahertz band, the seven gigahertz band, the four gigahertz band. All of these provide the capacity and the coverage that we need to make sure that we can connect everyone and that we can continue to lead in innovation. Mr. Todd, how does HTC utilize its spectrum across various bands to serve constituents like mine in rural America, in Adams County, outside of Gettysburg, in Bedford, in Fulton, in Huntington County. How does HTC look to achieve that? Thank you. For HTC, I definitely can't speak to the areas in Pennsylvania that you serve, but in rural communities that are adjacent to our service area, we look at additional spectrum as the needed tool for us to be able to 
uh, expand access, specifically for us, uh, hot spots and mobility are essential. We have areas today where technicians are unable to connect wirelessly in certain areas. We're using wired fiber facilities to complete orders, but we need mobility to be able to access and to communicate back with our offices to ensure efficient operations. So moving forward there, it allows us to be able to provide access quicker, more reliable access, and to serve more areas. Thank you. FCC Chair Rosenworcel recently announced that the FCC will begin an auction of additional bands this summer. What benefits, Mr. Todd, specifically for rural American would these additional auctions make available? Thank you again. For us, as consumer choice and competition are essential for additional bands of spectrum to be rolled out. Uh, in our opinion, having the availability and capacity for additional bandwidth is essential to achieve uh, what your objectives are. Again, I'd like to thank all the witnesses for your participation here today. I'd like to thank Chair Doyle for allowing me to uh, wave on to this important hearing. Thank you, and I yield. Thank you. Uh, gentleman yields back. I see we do have one more committee member who's come on. So we will yield five minutes to Congresswoman Kelly. Thank you, Chairman Doyle, for holding this hearing today. Spectrum issues don't often grab headlines. When they do, as we have seen recently, they suddenly are top of mind in national news. It is my hope that the renewed commitment of cooperation, including a forthcoming updated MOU between NTIA and the FCC will help ensure we don't have public spats around spectrum usage in the future. As 5G continues to roll out and the planning for 6G and beyond, beyond begins, it's important that the U.S. maintain its leadership position in deploying advanced wireless technologies. The government and the private sector must work closely to align technical specifications and investments to allow for quick, robust adoption nationwide. Ms. Stankovich, in your testimony, you spoke about how developers need to know which spectrum bands might be available to foster U.S. technology leadership. Can you walk us through the decisions that need to be made at both the international and national levels so a company like Intel can begin investing in chips to support future generations of Wi-Fi, 5G, and successive wireless technologies? Thank you for the question, Congresswoman Kelly. So when we look through the process, what we look at is to determine a new spectrum, when a new spectrum band comes online, you need to have the relevant components available as well. So you need to have radios, you need to have filters, et cetera. So what we try to do is make sure that we understand the international environment, uh, where markets are. Typically the U.S. has been in the front of that uh, in terms of identifying spectrum bands. And then we're able to take that and determine sort of when we would need to intercept in the product development type timeline. Uh, when we look back at 5G, uh, we actually completed our analysis and we're starting to intercept product timelines in September of 2015 for an, uh, a decision that the international community did not make until November of 2019. That gives you a sense of how long it takes to make sure that you have everything in place to support what's going to be needed at the, for global economies of scale. And uh, we look forward to making sure that the U.S. is able to be in a place to do something similar with respect to 6G. Thank you. Ms. Brown, do you have anything to add on uh, to the importance of strong, consistent U.S. leadership on spectrum issues to a company like Cisco? Uh, yes, thank you very much. Um, uh, Ms. Stankavage spoke about the importance of identifying uh, spectrum bands early so that industry can uh, plan and have equipment available. Um, outside of the ITU process, uh, for example, in unlicensed spectrum, uh, U.S. leadership plays a crucial role. Um, and we have seen in the last two years since the FCC opened up the 6 gigahertz band, again at Congress's direction from the Mobile Now Act, um, that an enormous number of countries are following suit. Um, so uh, this is all due to the fact that the FCC was the first mover and people are paying attention and wanting uh, the same kinds of innovation in their economies that we're getting here. So a very important issue to pay attention to and I thank you for the question. 
It's safe to assume, thank you, that consumers and business will only connect more devices and use more data in the future. So we need to prepare now so that our networks can support this dramatic increase in demand. Ms. Brown, I understand we will need to make more spectrum available for licensed and unlicensed use to meet these anticipated network demands. What do you believe are the spectrum bands that we'll need to free up first to allow for the rapid deployment of advanced wireless technologies? Thank you for the question. Um, the, the first issue, of course, is getting the 2.5 auction across the finish line, so we need uh, auction reauthorization uh, to get that done. Uh, I think the panel here is in agreement that the lower uh, 3 gigahertz band needs to be carefully examined uh, by NTIA, uh, the constituent federal agencies, and the FCC to determine what can be done in the lower three gigahertz band. I cannot emphasize enough how, imp how important three gigahertz spectrum is in 5G networks globally. So anything we can do there uh, is good. Um, there, are, there are other bands in play uh, for potentially for the future. Um, uh, Mr. Bergman brought up the four gigahertz band. That is a band that is being used by 5G in the Asia region. Um, that might, we, we might wanna look at that. Uh, and seven gigahertz, depending on what is in there, uh, could, be, uh, could be a band of interest as well, either for unlicensed, licensed, or both. Thank you so much, and my time is up. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The gentlewoman yields back. Mr. Wahlberg, I can't tell you how happy we are that you were <laughs> able to join us here at the last minute, and it's my great pleasure to yield five minutes to you. Mr. Chairman, you're so kind, and that's exactly why I came back to join you, to bring that joy. Uh, I didn't think my amendments in the other committee would take so long and, and cause so much disruption, but we'll try not to do that here. Uh, today's hearing is appropriately named the 5G and beyond. Um, as co-chair of the 5G caucus, I think we should be doing more to educate uh, members of Congress and staff about the opportunities of future generations of wireless networks. The promises of 5G and its successors are not just blazing fast download speeds for urban centers. They'll be key players in connecting rural communities like mine, deploying precision agriculture, spurring better telehealth services, and more. This is why I've directed my staff to begin reaching out to stakeholders to ensure that we as a caucus and a Congress are continuing to march toward 5G and beyond. It's imperative that we stay on top of these issues both at home and abroad and honestly and personally, whether we understand it or not, it's something that is coming and we need it. Uh, Mr. Bergman, uh, at home, a major factor of wireless leadership is ensuring that our spectrum pipeline does not run dry after the upcoming 2.5 gigahertz auction. And I'm sorry I missed, missed, missed Billy's auction that went on here. Uh, have you identified spectrum bands that would be good candidates for future 5G use and secondly, what can Congress do to help identify uh, these additional bands? Thank you for your focus on mid-band spectrum. It, it's absolutely critical. Um, you know, I would highlight the lower three gigahertz band is, is absolutely critical for 5G. Um, this is a place where dozens of countries around the world are already using the spectrum. So it's really key that we put this to, to play and uh, would certainly commend this committee to look at that. Uh, there are a couple of other bands that I would encourage you all to to look at as well too. The, the seven gigahertz band is an enormous band that has federal users in it today um, with important missions, but we think there are opportunities to be more efficient with the use of that band and to make some of that band available for uh, commercial license use. And then we ought to look at what other countries are doing internationally. The four gigahertz band is also being used uh, in Asia um, for, mid, for 5G services as well too. So we ought to be looking at each of these different candidates um, looking at what the rest of the world is doing, and then also leading as well, too. Mm -hmm. Just as we did with 600 megahertz, we can lead on mid-band here in the U.S., and so that's critical. We'd encourage you all, as you think about extending auction authority, to make sure that, that you all do what Congress has done each time it's extended authority before, which is to set a defined set of auctions. Yeah. Well, we, we do need to lead. We can't, we can't just get out of the way. We need to lead. Um, and, and thank you. Uh, for looking beyond our borders, uh, leadership in a national standard setting will allow the U.S. to shape 5G policies that benefit American companies and consumers, and uh, not bolster the deployment efforts of our adversaries. Um, Ms. Stankavage and um, Ms. Brown, 
both of your organizations have been very active in standard setting bodies around the world. Uh, can you, uh, how can U.S. participation in international regulatory processes be improved to help us take the lead in expanding spectrum for 5G and going into 6G? Thank you for the question, Congressman uh, Wahlberg. So I want to first differentiate between two types of standards bodies. Um, for instance, 3GPP is industry-led. Uh, the Intel representatives there, we are very active there and in others, Wi-Fi Alliance, IEEE, et cetera. Those are industry-led. And when you look at those, we send our technical experts, the ones who are doing the technical innovation and the ones who have the expertise in, in wireless networks and, and sort of how to best increase the uh, technical capabilities of those going forward. In the regulatory arena, we have the International Telecommunications Union, and that, that's a place that I have gone as a spectrum policy expert. And so that's the, the group that's looking more at, you know, sort of which spectrum bands are most, most applicable, et cetera. And there, it's really important that we, as the U.S., understand where we are going, uh, what, what we have in the pipeline in the near term, but also over the longer term, so we're able to make those priorities apparent and try to get other countries to coalesce around those. So I did want to differentiate between the okay. two different types of standards bodies. Thank you. Ms. Brown? Uh, I don't have much to add to Ms. Dankavich's excellent uh, summation. Uh, I will say that um, uh, standards uh, internationally play out in, in a number of venues, and U.S. leadership uh, is critical. Uh, for example, in the Wi-Fi world, we have an industry-led standards group, IEEE, that does most of the standardization work. But it turns out one of the key entities that does standards for Wi-Fi is also the European Telecommunications Standard Agency, ETSI. Um, and they are important because a significant part of the world follows their standards. So by leading here, by leading in IEEE, we've also been able to lead in ETSI. Uh, so, again, being a first mover is very important. Thank you. Gentlemen's Yield time back. has expired. Uh, seeing no more members, uh, the chair requests unanimous consent to enter the following <clears throat> records and other information into the record. A letter from a broad range of 20 carriers and members of the wireless ecosystem urging Congress to extend the FCC Spectrum Auction Authority. Letter from Digital Liberty to the House Subcommittee on Communications and Technology without objection. That is so ordered. I want to thank our witnesses for their participation in today's hearing. Uh, I would remind members that pursuant to committee rules, they have 10 business days to submit additional questions for the record to be answered by the witnesses who have appeared. And I would ask the witnesses to please respond promptly to any such questions that you may receive. At this time, the committee is adjourned.